Lou Ferrante, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Pat, for having me. And of course, returning champion, my celebrity guest co-host, Vic Ferrari. Hey, guys, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Of course. Nice to you meet you, Vic. You too, Lou. So, Lou, I caught you on the interview on the Art of Manliness podcast, which is one of my favorites, I got to say. And I was, it, oh, yeah, and it instantly grabbed me. And I'm like, I got to have this guy on my show. This is such an interesting story. Man, there's so many layers. You're like an onion, Lou. There's a whole lot of layers to you. <laughs> so, a little garlic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'm a little potato because, you know, I'm the Irish guy here. So, <laughs> let's start out with why do you think we're so fascinated with criminals, more specifically like gangsters? I wondered when I was doing my research, I came across a lot of fascination with criminals that dates back to the 1800s. Wow. I mean, you know, the, the Jesse James gang, people were fascinated yeah. with, uh, you know, all the way up through the bank robbers of the 20s and 30s after, you know, during the Depression, Dillinger, you know, Pretty Boy Floyd, etc. Oh. And I think that Americans, they like sort of like, they know we, lived in, we live in a corrupt system. Everybody's content with that to some degree. Okay, we get it. All of the people above us who preach all this morality are usually crooked. And we like when the guy who just waves the finger and says, I am crooked. I, you know, I'm not hiding it. I'm, I'm, you know, refreshingly free of false modesty. Here I am. This is what I do. And I feel like that sort of, uh, and I found even a quote from Oscar Wilde, uh, the British writer who said, Americans love their criminals and they worship them. And then in the age of the, you know, in the age of mafia, sort of like when ma the mafia became sexy, all these movies, you know, starting out with like, well, maybe a little with Edward G. Robinson, those type of movies, but really like when they started with the Godfather trilogy right. and, and Goodfellas, people started to see Goodfellas wasn't that obviously that romantic, but the Godfather trilogy was, you know, I think it gave the mob like a name that they didn't deserve where it looked really like fascinating and it was all about all of this honor and stuff and you know there's a little of that involved but for the most part that was a bunch of hogwash yeah you know i was just before i uh, hit record i was talking to a friend of mine that's a romance writer and we we're just and she just got her citizenship for uh italy and mm -hmm. you know she's from sicily her family is and i said you know and she said that you know mob romance right now is red hot that's like really? a huge genre right now. And like Cecilia, yes, I'm talking about you. She's and she, you know, she's got her finger on the pulse. And I'm like, okay, before you know, it was vampires and you know, like billionaire romance, and now you know, mob romance is like picking up steam. Every woman I ever dated was a mob romance. <laughs> I mean, I should be able to write that easy. <laughs> you should, you should. Yeah. You know, I my mind goes to like the Sopranos, Scarface, Sons yeah. of Anarchy. You know, yeah. they they were huge successes. Yeah, yeah, but what I liked about um, Sons of Anarchy, even though you know, I I talked to an undercover ATF agent that was in the Mongols, and he's like, "Yeah, we used to call it the Sons of Malarkey." Yeah, it's a bunch of BS. Uh, yeah, but yeah. if you're a biker, I, you know the ins and outs. If you're a biker, right. if you're not a biker, you buy it. Oh, exactly. Yeah. But the thing yeah. about it was, what I liked at the very end is like, you know, the main character Jack Steller is like, "We're not good people. We do really bad stuff." And, yeah. you know, he didn't want his kids thinking it was cool or wanted to glorify it or whatever. He says, yeah, we suck. We're bad people. We do a lot mm -hmm. of illegal stuff and we hurt a lot of people. So, yeah. yeah. But you know what? Scarface, Sopranos, like I said, you know, the, there's, they're huge. So yeah. for you, how do you keep these stories of the mob, you know, in the old days fresh for today's audience? You know, you're a writer, you've written a mm -hmm. bunch of books, you know, and mm -hmm. you're, a, I would say, uh, a very good historian as well of all this you. you know how do you keep it fresh for today's audience what i did in, in the borgata trilogy volume one is out now i what i did there was i was able to debunk a lot of myths and i remember when i was in prison i never wanted to look at the mob again you know i knew i was suffering for all the crap that i had done and i so i avoided books about true crime uh i stuck to history biographies once i became an avid reader and 
I the guys used to go to the television room once a week to watch the Sopranos and they go, Louie, come in. It's, it's, it's on the Sopranos is starting. I said, what are you watching that crap for? I go, this is what got us here. You know, you want to, what do you, what do you, you want to torture yourself? That's why we're here. So I never watched it. And then, uh, it ended up that when I came home from prison, I wrote a memoir and Lorraine Bracco bought the rights to that memoir. She optioned it for a year. Oh, wow. And I said, son of a bitch, I never watched the Sopranos. I got to go back and watch it. And I got, I got to tell you, I did get hooked. It wasn't bad. I thought it was done really well. So that said, I did remember, though, a lot of the guys who were in jail reading mob books. And a lot of guys, bosses, underbosses, capos, you'd hear a lot of them blurting out, bullshit, never <laughs> happened. Give me a break. So when I started doing my research, I realized that, you know, if you live this life, like the guys you said who, who were bikers, and they realized that the Sons of Anarchy – really wasn't accurate. Whereas the rest, the rest of us, we don't know any better. We watch it. We've never sure. been a biker. I've never been on in the hell's angels. What the hell do I know? I know I knew hell's angels, but I never been with the club. So I don't know any better. So the same thing when you're a mob guy, you know, if you're reading something that's true, that could have happened or it never did. So when I started reading all the history, I realized that, wow, there's a lot of things where a bell would go off in my head and I'd say, this never happened, whether it was about Frank Costello, Albert Anastasia, Lucky Luciano. And I would then try to trace back where this story may have originated. And I would find usually the original source. And then usually the case was that subsequent historians then would just quote the original source and repeat the story. And through time, it would become sort of like a time verified truth where it wasn't true. And then what I did, instead of telling the reader, this is bullshit, you should believe me because I lived a life, I would say to the reader, this is why this could never have happened. And mm -hmm. I would explain it. So I debunked a lot of myths where I, the, the goal is to get the reader by the time they finish volume one of the Borgata trilogy to think like I think and to know and smell it when, you, when something's off. You could sniff it out. And that's sort of like where I want the reader to come along with me on that journey. And I explain time and again, but I don't bog the reader down in sort of lessons and, and, you know, I'm not pontificating. It's gory stories. I get in deep into the intrigues. I keep the book moving lots of blood and guts, but I do, I do now and then veer off to explain something if it could never have happened that way. And I think that's what I brought new to the table. So it's sort of like reinventing the stories that you've heard all these years, but which ones are true, which ones could never have happened. And if it didn't happen, what might have happened, what probably happened. And so far, I've had tremendous, tremendously positive feedback in the way of people liking that. They've, they've really felt like that was sort of like really something new I brought to the table. Right. You know, thinking about, you know, the mob and street gangs of today, you know, where I worked in Milwaukee, it was split up by ethnicity. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, okay, the black gangs were black gangster disciples, gangster disciples, vice lords. Mm -hmm. The Hispanic mm -hmm. gangs were Latin kings and Latin queens, Mexican mm -hmm. posse, Spanish cobra, MS-13, brown pride, La Familia. Mm -hmm. La Familia. And then mm -hmm. for the whites, it was outlaw bi biker gangs. You know, mm -hmm. there was the outlaws, you know, they're mm -hmm. worldwide. And mm -hmm. what we call it was the bitch club was the black pistons. You know, mm -hmm. if you, that was kind of like their associate club, they were like mm -hmm. a tier down. And a lot of mm -hmm. guys would have to spend some time in that club before mm -hmm. they could bump up to the outlaws. Mm -hmm. And then I was introduced to the Asian Crips, ACs. Mm -hmm. I didn't even mm -hmm. know they existed until I went to a beatdown with baseball mm -hmm. bats. Mm -hmm. And one guy had an AC tattoo. And I'm mm -hmm. like, Asian Crips? He said, and he like smiles at me and he's got like a tooth missing. He's bleeding and shit. He's like, no, American citizen. And I'm like, oh, okay. That's what that means. And I'm like, yeah, my ass. Nice try. So what parallels, you know, are there between the mob and like street gangs like I just done? Same. Well, we got we got along with everybody. I did know I did know guys from all the different gangs. You said I knew the leaders of these gangs. I was away with some of them. Some of them I knew on the street, uh, and we got along with everybody. I was away with these. With the, when you talk about white gangs, usually it's their motorcycle clubs. But yep. I was also away. There were guys when I got my very first day in the population at Lewisburg Penitentiary in Pennsylvania, day one, and and your listeners could look up the story. I land in that pen. And the first day, the Aryan Brotherhood hacked to death two black Muslims. Um, Aryan Brotherhood were rough. I mean, they, they, they had prison-made machetes. There was a metal shop there where they made lockers, they made bunks, and they made machetes. And you could be walking in the yard any given day, 
and you'd see like a barred window. There was a particular place where they used to throw them. They tossed them out into the yard and then guys would either try to sneak them in from the yard or bury them mm. out in the yard. These, these machetes wrapped up uh, in something like a cloth or something with string or rope. Uh, but anyway, the Aryan Brotherhood, I was, I was with Jimmy Coonan, boss of the Westies. Uh, when I landed there, he greeted me, took me out into the yard. He had introduced me to the head of the Latin Kings, head of, head of the different uh, gangs. And then they called lock in. We went in. And no sooner did I get back in the block, I met the head of the Aryan Brotherhood that day in the yard. And he was as calm as me, you, and Vic are right now on this podcast. There wasn't any inclination that he was about to do something this horrendous. You would never have known. If I gave you a million dollars to guess what this guy was going to do, you would have probably bet a million that he was going to go in, crash on his bunk, and go to bed for the night. And that was it. And he went in and stripped down to his box of shorts, passed out homemade machetes to his gang, and they had a hit list. And after they whacked two guys, they were actually trying to get three or four more that they had on the list. But by then, the uh, the guard pulled the pin, you know, hit the hit the uh, panic button, and the, the alarms were going off all over the prison. And then they just said, basically, you know, they went off script and said, stab every end that you can. And they were just trying to stab any African-American that they could get their hands on. But they they had already bludgeoned two to death. So that was the Aryan Brotherhood. That was my first real introduction to the real Aryan Brotherhood. You know, it was my first day in the penitentiary. Sure, I met guys before in holdovers in the detention center in the state, in the county that claimed to be the dirty white boys or Aryan Brotherhood. But I don't think that they were to this level where these guys were all serving life and didn't care, didn't care if they ever left or not. You know, I mean, they, they just, you know, I mean, it, it was it was a different level of barbarism. So for you, you were connected to, you know, the mafia. So were you just in that subculture and people kind yes. of kept their hands off you? Yeah, well, yes and no. I mean, there's an element of people know us, so we get along with everybody. We have obviously alliances with everybody, blacks, okay. Asian, white, doesn't matter. You know, Italians know how to operate. We, when, And plus, we're one of the only groups that go into prison with a few dollars. So, we, wow. you know, if we want to flex our muscles, we could, you know, we could buy one gang off against another if we had to. You know, mm. I mean, we know how, we know what we're doing. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's more like... Uh, we get along with everybody, but you're still on your own. I mean, John Gotti got cracked in the face. You know, he had, he had a black guy that came out online. That's John Gotti. You know, somebody said to him, listen, I don't give a shit. You ain't sending your, you know, your, your, your dark Lincoln Continentals with violin cases in here. It's me and you, buddy. You know, and that's like the pen. You know, you're dealing with life is when I was in the pen, I had 13 years. I faced life, but I had a 13 year sentence. I copped out me and my co-defendants, everybody stood up and, uh, when I got there, everybody told me, don't tell anybody you're doing 13 years. And I said, why? That's a lot of time. And they said, not to these guys. Yeah. Most of these guys got that in or double that already. And they're never leaving. They'll be jealous of you. And I remember the day I was leaving Lewisburg a year, year and a half later, when I finally got uh, dropped down to a medium security, the, the hack came to my cell and says, you want to get locked in for the night? And I said, no, why? And he said, well, a lot of times guys are jealous if somebody's leaving and I've seen people get killed the night before they leave. I go, no, I'm all right. I ain't checking in. I'm fine. And uh, but that gives you an idea of you're in the pen. People don't care. You know, if a guy's got six life sentences and he thinks you stole his apple out of his locker, what, what is he going to get if he kills you? Right. Seventh life sentence. You only got one life to live. So these guys are dangerous. So it really doesn't matter. You got to handle yourself. You have to know how to handle yourself. It doesn't matter where you come from. However, there are alliances and you do get along with people automatically because of that. You know, when I was there, people knew I came from the Gambino crime family. People knew I was friendly with, uh, I'm still close friends with Vicarina to this day, 35 years later. Vicarina Sr. Was the, was the boss of the Colombo family. Vicarina Jr. was a captain in the Colombo family. My dear, dear, dear friends. So I get along with everybody. I mean, they, they knew where I came from. And uh, so that's sort of like wherever I landed, if any one of the five families was there, they would automatically take me around, introduce me to the other gang leaders and say, this is Louis. He's he's friends with us. And okay. then I was automatic friends with them. But that doesn't stop some some knucklehead, like I said, who's doing life from trying you. Then, then you're on your own. You know, at that moment, you're on your own. And uh, and I was ready for that, too. You know, at times I had to do what I had to do. You know, I mean, that's just life. That's, you know, that's what sucks about that place, though, because once I had a faith in God, I had a renewed faith in God. I lost faith in God when I was younger. Uh, my mother died in my arms. But when I renewed my faith in God, I would say a prayer that 
not only, you know, protect my own life, but I really don't want to kill nobody else, protect me sure. from killing somebody else because I'd like to get out of here without being involved in a murder, whether it's my own or somebody else's. And uh, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. I mean, that kept me going. So, and I, by the grace of God, I got out without having to kill anybody and without nobody taking my life. Lou, let me ask you, I always wanted to ask a guy this. So you were in a high level of maximum security, right? At yeah. what point does someone keep committing violence in prison that they say, all right, you know what, enough is enough. And they wind up at like Supermax in Florence. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because they, I mean, obviously they can't really hold much over your head if you're in a max. Yeah. But I mean, to go out to Colorado in yeah, that right. Supermax prison, I mean, yeah. how much is that a threat to guys? Like, do I really want to yeah. increase it's a great what I'm question. doing? Yeah, great question, Vic. And nobody really ever asked that question. I've never heard it before. And it's a great question because it gets into psychology. And there are people in jail who, even if they're doing life, They'd rather have an easier ride. They'd rather be able to go to the chow hall during the day, right. walk the yard, you know, until until lock in, play bocce, play handball, play basketball. There are guys that you could hold, you could hold dessert over their head. You're not going to get dessert tonight if if you yeah. f up. And it's true, you know. I, right. I don't want to lose my chocolate cake, even though I'm doing life. I really I like my chocolate cake. So there are guys that these these rewards and punishments affect them. Then there are guys who I believe. And I've seen quite a few of these guys and it's, it's staggering. And I had to think about where the hell, what's wrong with these guys. They are almost like self-abusive, like, uh, uh was it masochist, mas masoch sadomasochist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Masochist, masochist. Yeah. yeah. And you would see these guys get into a beef. They'd start a beef with, let's say where they know the goon squad is going to come and beat their brains in. And they do it time and again, they get out, they do it again, they get out, they do it again. Then they're in the hole. You'd be in the hole with a guy and the guy's flushing, you know, clogging the toilet and flooding his cell. And you're saying to the guy, hey, buddy, you know, they're going to come in there. You might have six inches or a foot of water in there. You might think you did something, but they're going to beat your brains in, brother. Yeah. Stop. Unclog the bowl and let it go down. F you. This guy knows what they're going to do. He must want the beating. You know, you got to say this guy's like inviting it. So those characters who are, who are uh, masochistic, uh, those guys just continue to ask for it until it's and even they start beefs with people where they know they're going to get hurt you see that too you know a guy will take on four guys you know uh, uh let's say a white guy or a black guy goes to the opposite race and tells them all to go f themselves you know what's going to happen you know i mean you don't have to be a brain scientist to figure this one out and you and or some i saw a guy one time walk into the television room you got 30 guys glued to the tv whatever the frig was on that day and the guy changes the channel. You don't know that 30 people are going to beat your ass right now? Of course you know. He was taken out in a stretcher. So these people are the ones who eventually then, you know, the system, you know, eventually just gets them out and says, look, you're, you're a problem. You're going to the supermax or you're, you know, after, and they might spend six months, a year in the hole before that decision is made. But then eventually they, they know that they're just a, a disciplinary problem. And, but for the most part, going back, so it's a psychology question, which I, I don't hear a lot of. So it's a great question, but going back to the 99% of guys in there, including myself, are sensitive to rewards and punishments. We don't want to lose the chocolate cake. We don't want to use our privilege, privileges. We don't want to lose the, the trip to the yard. We don't want to be locked down. We don't want to go to the hole. Uh, you go if you have to, you lose the, the cake if you have to, but it's got to be something that's worth it you know, for the most part. So that works for most people, but those people who are sadistic or masochistic, they, they, they just can't help themselves. I think well, you're right. I think it break, break, goes back to our childhood, right? Like yeah, your yeah. mother or your father, I mean, they're not going to take the belty every 15 minutes, but like you just said, well, you know what, when we were kids, you're not watching mm -hmm. the wonderful world of Disney or you're not <laughs> getting a piece of chocolate cake. And that was right, a big yeah. deal to us. Yeah. yeah. You yeah, know, it's right. funny because uh, Vic and I talked to a, a guy, his name is Matt Cox. He was in a medium security and mm -hmm. then, you know, he dropped down to minimum after mm -hmm. X amount of time. And he said a lot of the beatdowns were deserved. He said, you know, they're cheating at cards. They, mm -hmm. they owed, you know, like somebody for commissary or whatever. And it's like, well, what do you think is going to happen to you? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't yeah. go without consequence. Yeah. I'll tell you a story. You're right. Um, there was, Guys look for trouble. And you're right about that. And there was one instance I was in a detention center. I came back on appeal and I was in a detention center where um, there was a technicality that I was able to win an appeal on, not because I was innocent, obviously, uh, but I came back on appeal and I'm in a detention center and there was a kid I heard screaming 
And I went back there and there was a lot of guys around. I'm not going to say what type of guys or, or whatever. So yeah. nobody, so nobody was offended because it happens with every type of guys. So there was a, there was a group of guys around them. And I said, Oh, back off, leave them alone. And they did, they backed off. The kid had, he had a laundry net bag over his head and it's sort of like half tied up already. So they were abusing the kid. And I thought that something sexual was going to happen to him. So I stopped, yeah. I stepped and I took a shot. You know I mean? It's my own ass on the line. Once I step out for this kid. And uh, the next time I heard screaming, I went back there again and I said, what the F's going on? And that's when the leader of that group grabbed me and he said, hey, Lou, he looks for us. And I said, what? He looks for us. So he wanted that. So he liked being oh. abused uh, slash sexually abused by a group of men. Oh. This was his thing. So, you know, and then I said, son of a bitch, here I am reaching out. Yeah, you know, I could get stabbed. I could get caught. My throat could get cut. Here I am reaching out to help somebody. And he wanted it. He was looking for them. And, you know, when I, when he said that, I looked at everybody else, including the kid. And the, the kid's face was like, you know, kind of a shrug, like, well, you got me, you know? Yeah, you blew my cover. I was out here having fun, son of a bitch. You ruined it twice for me now. Oh, you know, so shit. whatever the case is, you don't know. You know, you got a lot of psychological yeah. issues in there. And I got to tell you, though. It's a cross section of society. We just don't know when we're out, when, when we're online at Costco, when we're online at Walmart, you don't know who's behind in front of you. You're right. When I lived in that place, yeah, when I lived in that place, I saw a lot where when I'm online now, I know somebody's, you know, somebody in this store's nuts. I don't know how many, somebody's off, you know, and, and you just, you just know it's a different cross, it's a cross section of society and you're seeing all of their human frailties out in the open. Whereas normally right. you don't see it out in the open in public, you know, sure. you don't, you know, until the neighbor gets raided by the police, you, you know, you yeah, don't know. You're right. You know. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right. So what is the attraction to being in like a gang, the mafia? Is it family, you know, like belonging to something? What do you think? I loved it. I thought I liked the sense of bonding. I liked to have, I liked, I loved my friends. I thought that we had something special with each other. Um, I don't like though the mafia, the bigger, the bigger part of the mafia is when you got a little crew of friends you grew up with and you love them, then you get involved with the mafia and you think you're bonding and you think you guys are still, you guys are just part of something bigger. But then at some point I realized that the mob could tell you to kill your friend and you got to do it. And, you know, I'm not killing a friend. So, you know, puts you in a jam um, so that, you know, so that's sort of like, you know, it's not as, it's not all roses. It's, it's not what you think. It's like, it's like everything else, right? Until, until you're part of it, you, people work so hard to become a, a partner in a law firm, then they're partners and they realize there's all kinds of headaches that goes along with it or something. You know, I remember I read an article in one of the newspapers where people more and more turn down partnerships in law firms for whatever reasons, you know, they don't want to be bothered with all the headaches that come sure. with it. And it's the same thing with the mob. It's the same thing with any, with everything. If we watch, look at Vic, right? We watch police shows all day long. It's, 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 it's the sexiest, romantic, toughest, courageous, big, biggest thing. You, Vic will tell you a different side of it. He'll go, you don't know what it's like. You know, first of all, if he, you know, the, the paperwork that's involved. Maybe he's got to walk in and see domestic abuse. Maybe he's got to walk in and see a head in a refrigerator. I don't know all the things you've seen in, in, in your career over there. You know, you, 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 you might say it's not as romantic as they portray on TV. You know, and you, you guys turn on the TV and turn it off, but live that walk in and smell a corpse and then tell me that's romantic and sexy. We're not smelling it in our living room. You know, it's not smell of vision. So it's a little different. <laughs> yeah. Lou, Lou, you were a big time earner. So I'm guessing, I mean, I've, I've followed your career. I've watched you on interviews and I know you were a big time earner. So obviously the, the you, you got, you got a lot of attention from a lot of the families because someone wants to latch onto you because now you're going to kick up. Mm -hmm. And you said that you were associate of the Gambinos. Um, how, how long were you an associate for with them? Well, you know, I, I, from when I hijacked my first trucks, in my late teens to when I went away at 25, I was around guys from really from a few different families, but for the most part, the Gambino family. So it was, you know, the better part of six years, I'd say seven years, I was in and out of um, people's houses, the biggest guys in the family. Um, you know, it's yeah. So I was there until the day I went to jail. And then when I went to jail, by the way, until I came home, I'm around those same guys, but in jail. You know, we just don't, we just reunite in prison. Yeah. I mean, sometimes, yeah. yeah. But at some point, someone's going to tap you on the shoulder, tap you on the shoulder and go, Lou, 
we want to propose you. Was that something you were looking forward to? Or was that yeah. something like, like, That's no, no. No, I, at that time I was ignorant and I desperately wanted it. I did. I oh, wanted okay. it before I went away. Um, a friend of my dearest friend, I've mentioned his name on other interviews. I'm going to hold back from mentioning it today. Sure. But it, uh, one of my dearest friends um, got straightened out right after I went away. And, you know, I was proud and happy for him. Uh, I probably, he probably would have brought me next. And then when I went home years later, he did ask me, you know, he says, you want me to put you up? I says, I'm a different person. Forget it. It's done. And he said, I thought so, but he, they kind of like my friends, when I was away, I'd be telling them I'm, I'm done with this, but everybody says that and they all go back. Sure. So, you know, really nobody believed me until they saw me and saw me like living a different life. And then they believed me. And this particular friend, to his credit, he was a great guy. A lot of friends realized when I was done, what good is he? What use is he? And I lost a lot of them. You know, they, they didn't need me anymore because I'm not involved in that life. And they are and they believe in that life. But this particular friend was still there for me as a friend, not as a mob guy. He wished me the best. He says, anything you ever need from me, I'm here for you. And, and uh, he was an incredible guy. I mean, he was just so. But for the most part, a lot of guys are like, he's done. Who needs him now? Uh, yeah. but, and a lot of guys don't don't go straight. You know, they, they talk about it. And uh, I remember one guy thought that I was playing it off, like just to come home, like, sure. you know, playing it off, like trick the feds that I'm, you know, like one time a guy says like, you're doing the chin gigante, like, you know, you're, you're fooling everybody. And I'm, I said, I'm not fooling anybody. It's real. I'm done. So, you know, so that's sort of like, you know, a different reaction I had from one particular guy. You know, I'm going to go back to the head in the refrigerator. I, I was a cop in Milwaukee for 25 years and oh, I, wow. And I knew the guy who found the head in the refrigerator, Dahmer's apartment. Oh, oh wow. Holy cow. Yeah. That yeah. will change you really quick. You know, right. that, yeah. That had so yeah. many ripple effects. I mean, one of the DAs in the case wound up being a Jesuit priest. He quit right. the DA's office and became a priest. He was so yeah. like morally offended by everything that he saw and it was involved yeah. in. He's like, how can a human yeah. do this to another human? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there you go, Pat. That's a perfect example. You know, you, and you saw 25 years of different levels of that. I'm sure. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Vic, you know, it's just, yeah. I, it will either push you towards God or push you away from God. That's the right. way I saw it. I saw a lot of like born again Christians. And then mm -hmm. I saw like extreme atheists because you'd go to a scene and it's like, well, there can't be a God if right. I'm seeing what I'm seeing. And then you go to another scene and it's like, how is this person alive? There must be a God. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. it, it goes both yeah. ways. Yeah. So let's talk, you know, mafia today. Are they still in operation? You think? I think to, to a, 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 a degenerative degree, they've okay. definitely lost a lot of the, the bigger rackets that they had. Um, you know, I was close. I got close in jail uh, for the most part uh, with Sal Avellino. He controlled all of the garbage on Long Island. They don't have mm -hmm. that anymore. You know, now it's the big corporation that controls all the garbage. Okay. Uh, or I should say he was charged with controlling the garbage. They had the garment center, uh, all of the trucking industry in and out of the garment center. They People probably still have pieces, bits and pieces of that still. But for the most part, most of the unions that they held have been infiltrated by the government. And the government then gives people a lot of opportunity. A lot of uh, guys get opportunities to like, okay, you have to leave the union if you can test it. Then we're gonna we're gonna prosecute and prove that you're somebody. If you don't contest it and you get the hell out, we're gonna leave you alone. And a lot of guys took that decision and said, "I'm out. You know, I'm, okay. I'm good." Whether it be whichever union it was, there was quite a few of them. I remember when I came home, a couple of guys approached me for legal counsel. They knew I reversed reversed one of my cases from prison, and I had helped other people reverse their cases from prison. So a lot of guys asked me legal questions, sure. and 100% of the guys that were were given that letter and asked me for their advice, I told, get the hell out. You know, to give you an idea, I said, get out. They're giving you a chance. Don't test them. Uh, okay. You know, so, so the, a lot of the unions are lost. Uh, you know, they might still have a little loan shocking. They might still have gambling. Uh, you know, they got sort of like the rackets that they probably should have stuck with from the beginning. But a lot of the bigger rackets, um, I think it's gone. Hijacking. Look, I, I used to hijack trucks left and right. You hijack a truck today. Where are you going with it? There must be 500 tracking devices on this thing. They're following you on an Elon Musk yeah, satellite. You're absolutely and, right. You know, yeah, yeah. And I'm going to have the two of you guys. So you on one, you on <laughs> one runner and Vic on the other. <laughs> go and get out in three seconds. Do I need that? So, you know, if you think about even the Spark Steakhouse hit, 
how many people would film that today on, on their iPhones? Right? Yeah. I mean, come on. You'd we'd have right. like, we'd see all the Russian hats and the, the Cossack hats and they're moving in on Castellano and everybody's got their iPhones out. So, you know, it's a different world. I don't know what you could get away with now. Uh, they could hear you through your cell phone. You can't even carry a cell phone anywhere. If you want to talk, they push a button. They can hear you through your cell phone. Yeah, I don't know what you're going to get away with really now. So I think they've lost a lot of the power that they had. And I think also, too, it's, it's not, it's not a, as attractive as it once was to young, stupid kids like me. Okay, I think a so, lot of kids realize there's bigger opportunities out there. Yeah. So you, um, you were born in New York City. What part of New York did you grow up in? Queens, Queens, New York, my whole life till the feds took me away and shipped me around the country. Queens, New York. Okay, so Queens, New York. How did a kid from Queens wind up hijacking, being a hijacker? You know, it's a good question. There's a few things that go into that. And it's, it's once again, it's psychology. Uh, so I think there's some thinking back again throughout my life. There must be something in people's blood, because a lot of times I know cops whose father was a cop, grandfather was a cop. It's in your blood. You've been, you're led that way. Or maybe you have, you know, uh, uh, you, from when you're young, that's something you want to do. You want to, you want to be somebody who goes out there and courageously defends somebody. And then, you, you know, obviously it gets involved with a lot of other stuff and there's just few courageous moments in there, but that's what draws you to it. And that's, you know, you want that. So there's different reasons why we're drawn to things, but there's a, a, an element of it is in our blood. And I'll tell you right now, my mother's family, my uncle was a hijacker. I could remember going to visit him in Sing Sing where my feet didn't even touch the floor in the visiting room, you know, and, and, and I, yeah. So here I am going to visit my uncle, uncle in Sing Sing, who was a hijacker. And then years later, when I got transferred from the feds to the state, I'm pulling in on the bus, I'm shackled hand and foot. I got a black box around my wrists. Uh, you know, it's, it just endured this long ride up to Sing Sing. I'm chained to the guy next to me on top of the black box on top of the shackles. And I pull up and I said, son of a bitch, I haven't been here since I was a kid. And, you know, I, so what, what went wrong in my bloodstream? What, yeah. what, what can't we shake out of ourselves that's in us? Uh, my father's family were law abiding people. My mother's family, like I said, you know, so, um, you know, it was a little different. So that's part of it is that you got something inside you, maybe in your bloodstream, that's a little different. And then the other thing too, is I think it's, it's sort of like nature and nurture, you know, the argument. A little bit is who you are. A little bit is, is sure. uh, how you're raised. A little bit is your environment. There's a lot of different issues. You know, behavioralism. Uh, psychologists have gone deep down that road and to try to figure out what makes the criminal mind. Uh, but I think it's also, too, a bit of that. I wouldn't have been in the mob if I grew up in, like, you know, boondock, Nebraska or something. But sure. I probably would have been, you know, rustling cattle or something. I don't know. Stealing corn. <laughs> I don't know what I would have been doing. Moonshine. You Do know, you I might think have been doing do you think it's like your friend group? You know, we, you know friends when you're growing up have such a huge influence on you, you know, yeah. more than your parents, more than your church, you know, the, yeah. your little buddies are like everything. Yes. And part of it though, is you gravitate towards the group of friends that you're comfortable with. Sure. So, you know, I mean, I, 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 I played JV football and, I loved it. And I loved the guys I played football with. Then I made the varsity team and I quit because I was already chopping cars and, and, you know, I was running a, in high school. So I, I moved away from those guys and I ended up hanging out with guys who were car thieves and guys who were involved in that business. And did I like looking back, I loved each group equally, but I think I was more drawn at that time in my life towards the, 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 group of thieves, the, the wild group. And I wish I would have stayed with the football group. You know, th these guys are probably the guys I would have more in common with today. But right. during that period of my life when I was wild and I wanted to do wild things and I wanted to make money and I wanted to go out there and do crazy stuff, I was drawn to that other group of friends. So you gravitate towards people who are a reflection of who you are. And I think we always do that. You know, I mean, th I think that's sort of like, you know, show me your friends, I'll show you you. So you started stealing cars and chopping them up. For those who don't understand what chopping means, could you yeah. kind of explain, you know, how did you pick sure. a car? How did you steal it? What did you do with it after you're done with it? Or originally, we would just do joy rides. Uh, okay. And we, there was no profit involved. We'd do donuts and ditch the car. The, the most sure. we got was like the change in the console, go buy a slice of pizza. You know, we're young kids. Uh, you know, somebody, everybody always had change in the console. You grab the change, you go buy a slice of pizza and that's it. Maybe yank the radio out. 
Um, back then they used to have the radio, then they did the Benzy boxes. I don't know if guys are uh, guys our age will remember that. Kids <laughs> nowadays won't know what the frigga Benzy box is. But it was sort of like it was a defense against people like me, the Benzy box, which was <laughs> you slip your radio in and it connects. And then when you get out of your car, you slip your radio out of the yeah, sleeve. Yeah, you take it out. Yeah. You take it with you. Yeah, you put it under the seat and you take it with you. And uh, so, you know, eventually we started selling those parts. And there were body shops. Vic will remember this probably. If you don't, Pat, there were body shops on College Point Boulevard in College Point. Then eventually we dealt with this big shop. He started on College Point Boulevard. And he eventually got this huge place that had it was it was from one end of a block to another and had entrances on both sides of the block and uh it was down by the Kosciuszko bridge either either like Maurice Avenue somewhere down there uh I think it was Maurice Avenue or I took Maurice Avenue to get there through one of the one of the uh, entrances and we would chop and ch uh, chop and cars bringing in parts around the clock and at, in the beginning we would we would ditch the car we would get an order for parts so just so your listeners understand a body shop gets your car you get into a collision and the body shop gets the car. And now the car's, let's say, if it's not totaled out, let's say it's got like $18,000 worth of damage today. Maybe back then it was like $8,000 worth of right. damage. And for that $8,000 worth of damage, the, the, the body shop has to go to either uh, direct to Ford or Chrysler or aftermarket parts that they would buy. If they didn't go direct to the dealership, they'd buy aftermarket parts or they would have to deal with parts and get them from a junkyard. But either way, it was cheaper to buy the parts from us stolen oh, yeah you know if we if we and yeah so we would then you know you if you if eight grand out of that eight grand you got a three is only labeled but you got to spend five in parts and you could buy the parts from us for a thousand dollars and save four grand on parts you're doing great times how many cars you're doing a week times a month times a year it made sense to use us so then we would get orders for cars and we got a little extra if it was the same color yeah uh, you know because so then paint. they don't have to spend yeah, you don't have to send it through the paint shop, which was good. Uh, so, you know, we were then in the beginning, we dumped the cars, the skeletons, uh, and we'd even take them apart in Casino Park, Cunningham Park. We would we would literally strip the cars there. And then at some point or another, one of the body shop guys says, I'm going to get you a warehouse. And back then, before 9-11, I flew to go do heists under phony names. You just booked an airline ticket. So it was easy to even lease a place under a phony name. Now you need ID. You got to do this. Right. You got to do that. You know, they, you, they have to verify who you are. It's a different world now. But back then, they just leased the place under a phony name. And then, you know, we left all the skeletons when we were done and just ditched it. So that we would do that. Um, and we tagged them now and then, too. I drove tag jobs. Uh, I remember, yeah. I that remember was my thing. You, that was your thing. Yeah. So I'll tell you what we did. And you, this will bring back memories for you then, Vic. We, wouldn't, we weren't really, like, sophisticated tag jobbers, just so you know. The GM... They had GM rivets. You know, you took out the windshield. Rosettes. And had... Exactly. That's exactly Okay, so right. you're talking about the VINs. You had the VIN number in the windshield, yeah. in the dashboard, yep. the front of the dashboard, usually on the left side, right where the, where the Reggie yeah. is. And you, we took the windshield out or we'll popped right. the dashboard out. We, we, you know, banged out the rivets. And then we would put the new rivets. We had the GM rivets. A friend of mine who was big in the car business got us the the legitimate GM rivets, the rosettes, like he said. So we would glue them in, crazy glue them in, and put, you know, put the thing back in, put the windshield <laughs> back in. Now, if Vic pulled us over and he checked all of the other numbers on the car, we're dead. But we were counting on just for the most part, if a regular beat cop, you know, regular. Well, you didn't even car, change like the door label or. Once in a while, we. That's the only other thing we did is this driver's door. We once in a while did. No, nothing else on the car. Once in a while, just the driver's door, the left driver's door, exactly right on the side. Were you getting that salvage cars and just take it? No, salvage. we would do clean titles. The salvage was always salvage was a mess because you had to go to motor vehicles. Right, right, right. For an inspection. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And then they bust your motor vehicle. So we you could watch the title that. by bouncing it into New Jersey. <laughs> we didn't know that. We, like I said, we weren't so sophisticated when it came to that. Yeah, I didn't know that one. So, so if, I know, if I had known that, I'd have done it. So yeah, we, we would buy clean title and it was, you just register it. It's done. Right. And you, if, you, if it's a different color, let's say, uh, let's say I had a, my, my wrecked car was a black Eldorado and then I stole a champagne Brits. Right. Mm. So I would then just change the that motor vehicle change. And say I painted it. 
and change it from black to champagne. But it was a clean title, so nobody's inspected it. No one cares. Did you try to keep the same year? Because a lot of times with I guys get greedy and they would I go did. sometimes the color, but other times <laughs> they'd go three, four years ahead. And we'd look and I'm like, there is no that's, way that's a 95. That, you know I'm what I mean? I'm make you laugh. You just nailed it. Yeah. So we always <laughs> tried to do the uh, we always tried to do the same year. And one day I got greedy and I did it was like a 79 tag, 79 rec. With like, I think by time, 82, 83, it was the same style. And whatever it was, whatever the years were, you might remember this better than I, I would. I pulled into a lot. Oh, I was going to sell the car. And we did this once in a while where we pulled into used car lots. Sometimes they knew, sometimes they didn't. And I pulled into the used car lot and I go, um, I asked for a lot less. I wanted quick cash. And the guy lifted the, hood, the lifted the hood and he goes, it doesn't make sense. This is the 4100 engine, right. the, the 4100 or whatever. So it was a different engine. Everything else about the body style was identical. Mm -hmm. And I said, I said, oh, sorry. And I closed the thing and pulled out. I closed the hood and pulled out of there. So the kids used to do that all the time with the BMWs. They would steal, they would have a salvage or they would get a three series uh -huh. bin kit. And then they put it on a stolen M3. Mm. and you see that thing go by and it's like that's not a kit he's got on there and then we pull him over and the next thing you know yeah. he's in handcuffs but yeah that that was my yeah. specialty tag job you sniffed, you, you sniffed them out on the street a lot of these then i'm sure right hundreds yeah well when i started out this was in 1995 stolen cars there was a chase every night not some nights but every night and the way you could tell well first off if somebody just took off when they saw you in a mark squad they're like oh shit mm -hmm. odds are it's a stolen car but back then, GMs were super easy to steal because you'd peel the yeah. column and just That's use right. a screwdriver to, you know, engage. It's so real. You just break the tilt. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. a lot of times that screwed up the um, the rear lights. Right. You know, it would screw up the electrical. And, you know, if the brake lights didn't work, the blinkers didn't work, it's like, okay. Or <laughs> if there's, like, no license plate or the license plate's hanging by one, like, not because they were in a hurry. And it's like all these things. It's like, you know, so if you're a writer and, you're listening. Yeah. These these are clues. Plus, yeah. there's also a bandana okay. wrapped around the steering column. Yes, or, or a tag job. job or a bandana. Oh, oh, yeah. this, the tag jobs. Yeah. It, yes. You'll have a you'll have like a blue interior with a red steering column. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> the fuck out yeah. of here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, and I don't know if you remember the foreign cars were just a slap hammer. A lot of yes. the uh, Japanese cars, we just we just use a uh, you know we use de oh, dent yeah, puller. Yeah, easy. Over the slap hammer, dent puller, pop it right out, screwdriver, you're out of there. Yeah. Well, we had a problem with bump keys for Toyotas mm -hmm. and Hondas. It, mm -hmm. it was a shave down key, and if you just slammed it in hard right. enough, mm -hmm. it would start it. You know, you could get really? them on freaking yeah. yeah, you yeah. could get them on Amazon. I mean, oh, so that's more recent than I'm going back yeah. in the late '80s, early mm -hmm. '90s. Yeah, that's so more this recent. is more recent. And we had a chief that did away with car chases. And so, of course, the stolen car market just exploded. You know, it's like yeah. cops can't chase us. So, of course, yeah. we're going to steal a whole lot more cars and do more crimes. Right. And where I'm in all these meetings, I, I was a sergeant, I was a boss. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, we need to think of fresh new ideas to get these car thieves. I said, chase them and arrest them. And, well, Hello. we can't say that in front of the chief. We can't right. do that. And I'm like, so... You know, I've got a lieutenant sitting next to me and he says, hey, we did a search warrant uh, yesterday on a house where we think these guys are stealing cars and mm -hmm. we found a bump key. And I said, that's all you got out of a search warrant? One freaking bump key? I said, did you arrest him? And he's like, well, no, I, it's not illegal to have one of those. It's illegal if you're using it, but it ain't illegal yeah. to have one. You know, it, yeah. and I just yeah. it was like popping a balloon. You know, he was all excited and happy. And I'm like, well, was the car in his basement? You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> these That's people are just, it's yeah. so ridiculous yeah. and then like modern we had audis getting stolen because mm -hmm. the shitheads found out that in the owner's manual there's a plastic key so you break mm -hmm. the a lot glass. of high-end cars bmw mercedes yeah. it's a valet key that comes yes. in that book so you know you're like mm -hmm. with the newer cars it's like a it's like an encyclopedia britannica that's in the yes. box that nobody looks at yeah there's a, those oh, wow. keys in there yeah, yeah, so yeah, that's after my time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a bunch of Audis that are just picking the bones clean from there. And Kias, for some reason, we even had a, a gang called the Kia Boys. That's all they did was steal Kias because they were so easy to steal. It, they made a video on YouTube. This is how stupid they are. 
Oh, they made a rap you video guys, on YouTube. I hope you guys got them on that. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, they're <laughs> all in sp- jail. the stupidity. Oh, my God. <laughs> and then, you know, it's some white kid from the suburbs that's making this video, and he got arrested. Yeah. For being like, <laughs> he's like I, I don't understand. And it's like, you should, you're an oxygen thief. That's what you are. You're just dumb. Yeah. You know, it's just, yeah. oh, my yeah. God. So, yeah. you know, you're doing these uh, chop jobs, then you're, I yeah. guess graduated up to hijackings, you know, like yeah, the, the hijacking stemmed from the cause, believe it or not. I was yeah. in, I was in an auto body shop one day, and there's a huge, you know, this the old snap on toolboxes. Uh-huh. Oh yeah, <laughs> might have been Matco. Yeah, and this thing's huge, and it's like yes, the size are. of a dress. And I said, "Wow, you know, what's this thing go for?" And he said, "Some a few, few thousand dollars these things go for." And then Ooh. he told me. Big money. Yeah, and so the truck comes once a week, every other day. Yep. Sometimes it depends. And I said, "What's the truck worth?" He goes, "They probably got a hundred grand on there." So I said, "You kidding me? You want one?" So that's sort of how the high. <laughs> yeah, the, the light went off. off. <laughs> yeah, light bulb went off, and then uh, I realized that I, in all of my stupidity and ignorance, I was smart enough to realize that, gee, I have to steal X amount of cars, as opposed to this one truck. And, you know, mm. if I could get X amount of dollars for this truck, I, you know, I could, I could do this one truck. And then, then I realized that there's all these other trucks that are just as easy to take. And some of them have loads that are worth a lot more. And that's sort of, then I, I veered off into, and I wish because the hijacking was ended up heist and hijackings is what I ended up doing for years then after that. And that's what got me in, you know, a heap with the feds and had I stuck with the cars Eventually, you and Vic would have arrested me. I probably would have been two or three years, maybe if four. That, if that if probation that, where I was at, yeah, on yeah. your tenth or eleventh, maybe you'll get like right. a month. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's... yeah. Well, it would have been, it would have been the, if I was smart enough to realize like rewards and you know risks versus reward. Right. I probably would have been smart enough to say, why don't I stick with the cause and never pick up a gun, you know, and never. It would have been a different world, and I would I would have been in and out like you said, yeah. But then again, too, you know, look, look. We're, we all have a path in life, right? So Absolutely. I regret the things I did, but whatever it was, you, you know, it, it, it's, I probably couldn't have averted it. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you really ramp things up because, you know, stealing cars for the most part is kind of a safe thing. You know, you're not doing it yeah. when the person is there unless you're hijacking yeah. somebody, carjacking mm-hmm. somebody. No, but we would never that... carjack. That, we, we, that was an innocent person. So it was like, yeah, it wasn't like goods is like, I mean, not that the driver of a truck isn't innocent. Right. And it felt horrible. But I felt like a, there's a difference back then I felt between a domestic where you're taking a mother and father or a grandmother out of a car, as opposed to we just want your truck. We promise we're not going to hurt you. You know, we just we just want the load. And we felt like then in, in my own sick mind, I felt like we were sort of like Robin Hood-esque where we were like, you know, we're stealing from corporations sure. that could afford to lose a load. Whereas I don't want to steal somebody's car. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I love everybody in my neighborhood. I love all my neighbors. I love my friends and family. It's, right. I felt like then that would be like beneath me to do something like that. But looking back, not to say what I did was any better. You know, you're taking a truck driver. He's shitting in his pants too. Uh, we, yeah. we would tell him, right away, we don't want to hurt you. I mean, yeah. nothing boiled, made my blood boil more than a carjacking where you have like some woman in the alley parking her car you know she's got an armful of groceries some shitheads come along knock her yeah. down she's pregnant and they have to kick her in the stomach a few times uh you know and like yeah you know, just yeah. It, it it just makes you want to just catch those guys yeah. so oh, yeah badly pat, oh i gotta tell you pat if i was if i witnessed a carjacking i'd have been the guy i'm not calling the police i'm coming after you myself so that's not that's how much i was against something like that yeah, um, that's just. You know, I, look, I was in front of when I was a kid. I got a. I mentioned it in my memoir. I still have it somewhere in my papers. A bank president gave me a commendation because he was looking through the window when one of his patrons or customers, rather, or an old woman, walked out of a bank. Me and my friend, we were kids at the time. We we're in a stolen car. Give you an idea how twisted our mind was. We're in a <laughs> stolen car, and I'm watching this old lady walk on the sidewalk, and some kid swipes it up with a razor. And he grabs her bag. He said later, I was only trying to cut the, I carry that to cut the bag strap if they hold it. So, but he's, all I see is a swipe and he grabs a pocketbook and takes off. So in my mind, he swiped at an old lady with a knife. That son of a bitch. I jumped out of a stolen car, tackled him to the ground, disarmed him. 
and held him until the bank president came out, called the cops, 109th precinct came, locked the kid up, and I got back in the stolen car and drove away. He goes, what's your name? <laughs> the club, yeah, he goes, what's your name? I gave him my name before I yeah. got back in the stolen car and drove away. I gave him my, you know, obviously my friend's in the car, so it's not like he's going to, you know, he don't know it's stolen. So I give him my name and he writes this beautiful commendation to my house that I still have today. So that's sort of like my mind. And some people will go, oh, you know, you know, in the mob, you know, if the mob guys knew that I did that, they would have said, oh, you're not supposed to. Interfere. It's an old lady. You swipe at an old lady with a right. knife. I don't give a shit what you're about. Yeah. You're going down, you know, so so that's all I saw. But in my twisted mind, like I said, I'm committing a crime over here. You know, I'm getting back into a stolen car and driving away. So, you know, sure. it's like but it gives you the sense of how twisted your values are at that point. You know, I love but my family and friends. I wouldn't want anybody to see carjacked, but I'd hijack. So, you yeah, know, but there's it. certain things, you know, I was born on the south side of Chicago. You know, my all my family's from from Ireland and my grandma on St. Patrick, like a couple of days before St. Patrick's Day is going to the dime store to get St. Patrick's Day cards. She's 80 years old, four foot ten. And some mm. asshole is taking her purse on the street, broad daylight, mm. knocks her down, breaks her arm. And there was a couple of citizens that saw it and ordinarily you'd say, well, those are kind of some shady characters. They chased the guy down and held him down until sure. the cops got there. Yep, and there luckily go. there was a beat man there. And <laughs> this is Chicago a while ago. And it's like, so they call an ambulance. He says, I'm not hurt. And he said, you're going to be. So they, <laughs> they broke both of his arms and his jaw. Yeah. And there was a preliminary come. hearing. I'll just come. finish the story. There's a prelim hearing. And they wheel the guy in, the defendant, in a wheelchair. And he's got both arms in casts and his, his jaw is wired closed. And the judge is just looking at my dad's with my grandma. And my grandma, you know, again, 80 or 80 years old, wearing a babushka, you know, arm in a cast. You know, she had to have surgery for where it was broken. And they're leaving and they're still in the courtroom. And my grandma's trying to give the cops hundred dollar bills. It's like, oh, thank you so much. Like, no, no, we can't do that in here. No, no, Mrs. McKay, please don't do that in here. Yeah. Here's for your troubles, for your troubles. Yeah, real thick Irish accent. I'm like, oh my God, no, grandma. You I, think can't. That, I, think, I think that's when cops and, and criminals, for the most part, are on the same page. You yes. see a little old lady get tossed to the ground. You know, I mean, that's it. You yeah. know, for the most part, most criminals, not all, all. bets are off. Yes. No yeah. doubt about all it. Yeah. So you're doing hijackings that really ramp stuff up. Did you ever think that you're going to get shot or hurt or even not, arrested? No, we, we were brazen. I'm going to tell you something. The first truck I hijacked and we, we had somebody throw shots at us once when we were robbing cars, by the way, it was an off duty cop. Oh, but, wow. you know, hopefully, hopefully he was aiming over our heads. Although we were short, <laughs> hopefully he was aiming over our heads, but, uh, <laughs> Whatever the case was, when when I hijacked my very first truck I hijacked, this is a true story, the guy says to me, he goes, you guys are really, me and my friends were on the, on the truck. He goes, you guys are nice kids, you're not, because we told him, look, we, we only want the truck, we'll never hurt you. We put a pillow under his head. We said, do you need anything from the truck? He says, yeah, give me the pictures of my family. Put them in my mm. pocket, please. Give me my, give me that clipboard. I need it. Just stick it under my arm because so I could make it the insurance thing a lot easier for me later. It's got the manifest or whatever, the, the sheet. So, at some point, he goes, you guys are really nice kids. He goes, you ever think this is going to catch up with you? I didn't think about that until I was in the penitentiary. Mm. That's when it came back to me. I went right over my head. It had to catch up to me. I just started. You know, like, how would you even think about that? So, no, I never thought about uh, – I look back and I say, thank God, not only did we never get shot, but thank God we never had to shoot anybody. Right. Because it would have, yeah, the guilt – I would, the guilt would have killed me. I have, I had enough guilt at one point when I started to reevaluate my life. I had enough guilt just from the things I did, let alone if somebody had accidentally been killed. I mean, I would, I would have probably just murdered myself because I was on the verge of suicide just thinking about all the shit I did. So I don't think I could have lived with that guilt. And I thank God, looking back, you know, even if, even if you're stealing a car, you could, you could um, accidentally kill somebody, an innocent pedestrian, because you're, sure. you're racing through you know, through streets. I'm going to tell you something that nearly broke my heart. And I almost had to live with this guilt. And I thank God I didn't. There was a guy named Mike and he was from the, uh, like sort of middle village mass area. He used to steal cars for me. And I had a Lincoln LSC. You remember those cars with the, with the, uh, Bill Blast rag top. And oh, okay. he said, yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. So he goes, Lou, I could, it was a two door, the Lincoln LSC. They made them for a few years. He goes, Lou, I could steal you to skirt. Uh, I'll get you to skirt kit in the rims for this. I said, sure. I'd love it. So then one night he's stealing cars and apparently he was being chased by a cop and he, he ends up, he was with a guy and two girls that were in the stolen car with him. So he might've picked up the girls after while he was using his stolen car, but he's with a guy and two girls. And as he's being chased, he gets enough distance between him and the cops and he tells them get out. So he get everybody else out of the car. Thank God. He was a nice kid. I got to tell you, rest his soul. And a couple of miles later, he gunned it. A couple of miles later, the cops were on his ass again. And what happened was down by that uh, sort of like uh, Grand Avenue section, there was a garbage truck that saw the cops chasing him. Mm. And the garbage guy figured, you know, look, let me help the cops. And he pulled the garbage truck out into the intersection. And this, the, the car went straight under it. And, mm. uh, and he was dead. So when I heard that he died in an LSC, I'm going to tell you my heart was torn out of my chest. I was, I was a mess. And when I got down to where the car was, I had to go see the car. And when I got down to the car, one of the greatest reliefs in my life, in my entire lifetime, was the moment I saw the car, which by the way, had no drivers, completely crushed from the top. And the, the hood was against the, you know, there was no place for your legs in the driver's mm. section. You know, just, just imagine, it was just, you know, he was crushed, like yeah. in a crusher. But by the grace of God, I saw that it did not have rims and it did not have a skirt kit. And I said, thank God it wasn't the car that he was stealing Uh, from me. And I I would have lived with that guilt the rest of my life. I would have, I would have been tormented the rest of my life. And I thanked God by the grace of God, this car had nothing to do with me. Um, I didn't give him an order for that car. It didn't have the skirt kit or the rims, which means it wasn't the one he was getting for me. And I was just relieved and, um, and still tormented over his death. But so just to go back to what you were saying, had I been responsible for somebody's death, it would have killed me for the rest of my life. And uh, I thank God that didn't happen. So you're leveling up, you're making some money. Is that when organized crime kind of took notice of you? It's like, hey, this guy is. Actually, if you're making money on the street, it's almost like if you're if you open up, let's say let's say you're in you're you're in Chicago. Right. Yeah. And you go, here's a here's a real uh, high traffic area. I'm going to open up a cell phone store. And you open up a cell phone store on the corner and you're making money hand over fist. Everybody needs a new cell phone. And you got traffic coming in and out. How long do you think you're going to go before the IRS comes in and says, do you pay your taxes? You know, right. just, just curious. Have you filed your taxes? No, but well, well, how'd you know I was here? We'll find <laughs> you. You know, they're going to find you. <laughs> yeah, they will. <laughs> so, yeah, so if you're making money on the street and word gets around and you're hijacking trucks, guys mm-hmm. hear about it. And, you know, also, too, I'm dealing with a lot of different guys because they got to sell the loads. So I'm meeting this guy. I'm meeting Vic. I'm meeting Pat. I'm meeting uh, Joe, Joey, okay. Vinny, you know, so I'm meeting different guys to sell my loads. And then you're meeting some guys who are on the fringe. You're meeting some guys who are real. You're meeting some guys, who, you know, who bullshit a lot. You're meeting some guys who they tell you, drop it off at eight o'clock. Your money will be there. And it is. So you start to like figure out who's real, who's not, who I'm going to make money with, who I'm not. It's a big, long process where it's, and you know, it doesn't just, it doesn't just happen. You know, I could never go back. Let's say I wanted to go back to the streets tomorrow just to relearn whatever the frig is going on would take me too much time. You know, probably take me the rest of my life. It's a process you got to be involved in. It's it's a lifestyle that, that comes with it morning, noon, and night. Your life becomes a, a crime in progress and every waking minute is meeting somebody, talking to somebody, right. you know, doing something. You can't do that part time and you can't do it on a fast track. It's something that has to happen naturally. It evolves by itself. And that's how it happened. Okay. So a typical day, you know, now you're in the mafia. Mm-hmm. What's like a typical day in the mob? Did you talk typical in code is, or what? Yeah. You talk to guys that, you know, I didn't like talking. So they had never had tapes on me. I had three indictments. Yeah, I was indicted by the Secret Service. I was indicted by the FBI and I was indicted by Nassau County Organized Crime Task Force. Out of the three indictments, there was never a single tape on me because I was Um, anal about talking on the phone. If somebody called me and talked on the phone, I hung up. If if I was even in a car, I didn't even want to talk in the car. Yeah, I was I was totally. And then I was the first guy to go away of everybody. I said, all you guys haven't stopped bullshitting. And I'm the first guy who goes away. (laughs) I used to tell them that on the visits. I go, you guys are talking all over the place and they get me. So I would even be in a car. Let's say me, me, you and Vic are traveling in a car 
and we stop and and let's say you uh, Pat, you stop bullshitting about you know that thing we did the other the last week. We grabbed that truckload or whatever. I would say pull over, pull over. We were on the Van Wick Expressway. Let's say pull over. I don't even care if it's Expressway. Pull onto the shoulder. We'd get off on the shoulder and we'd get out of the car and we'd talk. And then when we were done, I'd say, look, come on, don't talk in the car. We don't know whose oh, car's okay. above. So sure. I was anal like that. And then we get back in the car. So we were like, I was mostly careful. And I was ended up getting, like I said, I went down first, which was interesting because I was a little wild. I did a lot of things too, but I was really, really careful. And my friend used to bust my chops about that. He says, you're nuts. You think they care about us? Come on. You know, meanwhile, yeah. you know, they're looking for big guys like John Gotti. They don't care about us, but you know what? I learned when I had all those indictments that they do care about all yeah, of us. Absolutely. And yeah. So yeah. I mean, look, yeah, you well, guys want to go up. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. 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 Now, did you hold like a legitimate job just for like IRS you know, purposes? No, I never till the day <laughs> I went to prison. I never worked a job in my life. And and uh, to this day, I came home from jail and I became a writer and I would be writing all day. And then I talked to my father and he goes, once you get a job. I go, Dad, I got a job. I haven't left my desk. Though. I've been at my desk for 12 hours. That's <laughs> yeah. not a real job. Go, go work a real job. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I never punched the clock my whole life, but I've worked. You know, I mean, you okay. know, I, I busted my ass since I came home from jail in every other way. But I, I never had a job back then. I okay. was one of the guys. Some guys did have a job. I was with guys. And, you know, my, the core guys in my crew didn't work. They were like me. This okay. was their full-time job. Now, there were guys, believe it or not, I had a guy who was great at heists, one of the best guys you could ever bring. And this goes to show you, this is a good, this, this is a good uh, question for psychologists. What goes, into, uh, what goes into this sort of like the nature of this type of person? And I think it's just survival. That's what I think. But if we had, let's say he's working, he was a carpenter. Let's say he's working and he's got work and he's, and they're feeding him work and he's, he's framing houses and everything's good. And he's only making a few hundred dollars a week, let's say back then, which was a lot of money. Right. And I went to him and I say, I got a million dollar heist. He would go out pass. I need you. I tell you, come on, come on. I, Lou, I'm good. I'm working. Thanks. You pass on a million dollar heist. Absolutely. I don't need it. I'm happy working. Now, if he was out of work, and his bills weren't paid. He was the first one banging on the door going, what do you got? <laughs> and I, if I told him I got something for 10 grand. He'd go, I'll do it. So I'm going, you son of a bitch. You didn't want the million dollar yeah. heist when you're working. Now you're going you're gonna to stick somebody up for 10,000? Yeah, why not? I need money. So this is a guy who's really not a hardened criminal. You know, he's, this is where we could talk about, like, if the economy ever really tanks in this country and we go back to the Depression era, what this country is going to look like. Because a lot of people who wouldn't normally commit crimes are going to be out there committing crimes. Yes. I promise I, you. And I that, yeah. Absolutely. And that's an example of that. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, you often hear, uh, let me go back a little bit. So eventually you got arrested. What were the mm -hmm. circumstances and which agency or agencies gotcha? So the first thing that happens was I got, I got subpoenaed and uh, I tip my hat to the feds, the, the FBI agents. They did a great job with me. They tore apart my life. And they, they really made me feel like I was public enemy number one. And when I eventually went to jail, from the biggest bosses and underbosses to the smallest guys like me, I realized that they made every one of us feel like public enemy number one. And I got to I got to tip my hat to you guys as law enforcement officers to make people feel like that is, you know, you're doing your job right. If you make people feel and, and I think I think Vic said it a minute ago, that's how we go up. You know, you, you put all the pressure on the little guy. He gives up the next. Oh, level yeah, the absolutely. Next yeah. You make your way up. So but so the first thing was they came to my house with a subpoena and they subpoenaed me the feds. So I saw I looked out my window and I saw trench coats on my porch. Ugh. So I said, son of a bitch. It's you know, it's got to be feds. You know, you just normally cops were dressed down. You know, I saw it. So sure. and. So I said, ah, it's got to be the Fed. So I called my friend. I told him, pick me up around the block. And I did the backyards. And I went to, I'm going to tell you how on top of things, though, the Feds were. I went to a friend of mine's store, which was one of my haunts. And I get into the store. I go in there and I'm in the back and I'm talking to him. And I'm going, the Feds were just at my house. How do you know they were Feds? I don't know. They dressed like Feds. They, was, they were stiff looking. They had trench coats on. They, I looked out the window. I saw it. So I, and so he says, oh, so, so somebody yells in the back. He goes, Lou, the feds are out front. You think it's for you? It was for me again. They came right to where I hang out. They're on your phone. So they knew. They were going, 
Yeah, yeah. That or they they knew my haunt, so they were gonna go one at a yeah, time. Or the they were surveilling you. So whatever the case was, now I got yeah. So eventually I get a subpoena, and I'm gonna tell you what happened with this subpoena. This is interesting. We had a guy, my friend's uncle. Now the mob guys, I dealt with the mob, obviously, and all the families. But I never, believe it or not, I didn't fence my trucks to a mob guy because they always try to get you. They, they got the, they're chomping on a cigar and they know you want your button. So they try to get your figure. And I got the guy by the balls. Right. You know, I owe maybe 100000 for this load, but he wants his button. I'm going to offer him twenty. But do me a favor, Louie. You know, Louie, you know me. I'll always look out for you. You know, it's always the same bullshit with these guys. So I'd rather just sell it to my own guy and then kick up to who I got to kick up to. So you're still appeasing the guys you got to appease. You know, you're still in with the, the guys in your, your, your family. You're still putting it on record. You're still paying people. People are making money, but nobody's taking me for a ride. So I used to go to my friend's uncle and my friend's uncle, another friend of mine had an uncle who was from the city, 47th Street, Manhattan. He lived in Times Square, but he was a hustler on 47th Street. I'm going to give you a, a little insight. This guy was one of the biggest fences you could ever meet. Like if you went to him and said, I have the crown jewels, taken right out of the Tower of London. <laughs> Most people would go, what the frig you want me to do with those? I get busted in three minutes. He would take them. He knew what to do with them. He knew how to get rid of them. He'd been down there for 40, 50 years. He knew that, that street inside and out. And that was the biggest concentration of gold and diamonds in probably the world, 47th Street Jewelry District. So we would go to him and he took any load. He was a fence. And it didn't matter, Just not just jewelry, not just diamond stuff. He just happened to be from that area. But it could be a load of anything. It could be a load of uh, American flags. And he'll tell you, I know where to sell them. There's a MAGA rally coming up. We're going to get rid of them. We're going to unload them at the MAGA rally. So whatever the case was, you know, there was no MAGA then. But whatever the case was, you understand. So he, he knew how to get rid of everything. So this guy, he one day when we get subpoenaed, I get subpoenaed. Then my friend gets subpoenaed. Another guy gets subpoenaed. And we're trying to figure out what's going on. Then he gets subpoenaed, the fence. So we're on our way to the city to go bullshit with him one night. We're going to talk about the subpoena. And what the Fed did was when our lawyers called up, my lawyer specifically called up and said, what are the things you're looking into? What's the subpoena for? And they listed off a, a, a series of different crimes that they were investigating me and my friends for. So we're on our way to the city to talk to him. I called him. His name was, I could say his name. I think he's got to be gone now. He was in his 60s then. So he'd be like, you know, close to 100 now. Yeah. Um, but we called him in my memoir, Uncle Jimmy. His real name was Uncle Billy. So we called him up. I says, we're on our way into the city. And before we get to the city, we got off by, I don't know if you remember, there was like uh, uh, the mass pit exit over Fresh Pond Road. We got off over there. And there used to be this eatery called Bettino's. Oh, yeah. It was there for a while. You remember it, Vic? Okay. Yeah. So we went to, I says, go to Bettino's. We'll grab a bite to eat before we go into the city because we're going to be with your uncle all night. And so we go over there, we, we're grabbing a bite, and I'm going over in my head the things the feds want to question us about. And at some point, I realized we had told them a little while back, we wanted to keep them honest. So we told them, look, we got a load of whatever it was, but we didn't have it. And then we were going to tell them, the plan was to tell them we had a load of X, Y, Z, and then we got rid of it before we, we ended up unloading it to somebody else. We dumped it elsewhere so that he knows we could go elsewhere with, with our loads. We don't need him. So we're going to make up a load, tell him we got it. And then a few days later, we're going to tell him we dumped it elsewhere just to keep him honest. Well, it turns out he was always honest with us. It turns out we had no reason to fear that he was cheating us. He wasn't. But we did this. We did this because we thought in our head that he lowballed us on a couple of the last loads and we wanted to keep him honest. So whatever the case was, we never hijacked this one particular truck. So when we go through the different things that the feds got that we really did do, and this one thing is jumping out, I said, son of a bitch, we never robbed that truck. He says, what do you mm. mean? I go to you, told your uncle to keep him honest. He goes, yeah. I says, if the feds know about this and it never happened, it can only come from your uncle. Your Him. uncle's the real. Yeah. Yeah. So he goes, no, my uncle's not. I says, I'm telling you, he says, son of a bitch, you're right. So I said, call him up and I bet you he's going to get all bent out of shape. That we're not coming. He must be sitting in the room wired. They probably got cameras all over the room. We're going to talk about everything we ever did with them. And they're sure. going to come out from behind the door and arrest us. So he goes, yeah. So we called up and he was bent out of shit. When are you coming? What do you mean you're not coming? Why aren't you coming? We need to talk. So I said, wow, he's a rat. So that sort of like sparked the whole thing. So now I got yeah. the FBI on me. And then at some point I get arrested by the Secret Service. 
And the Secret Service case was interesting because I go, what I I never threatened the president. I didn't know what the Secret Service did. <laughs> you know, and then I'm thinking maybe on the phone I, when I'm in a tirade cursing everybody. This son of a bitch and bastard, that other bastard. This other, maybe I did curse the president. Who knows? I don't know. <laughs> so and they picked it up. I'm trying to figure out why the Secret Service is surrounding my house with machine guns. What the frig is going on, right? So it turns out that I was involved in a thing where these guys was opening up companies, and they would open up a, like a, a fake company, get approved to accept credit cards, run forty, fifty thousand through, or whatever it was, and then close up and walk away draw the money out and they would, they would defrauding the credit card companies by making phony mm. sales, phony purchases through shell companies. So that's, that's how I understood it at the time because I wasn't necessarily involved directly with that. So that's how I understood it. But at some point they started screwing each other. And one of the guys involved came to me as sort of like the mob guy who was going to get his money. So I told him because I had a name on the street that I was with the Gambino family. People knew who I was. I said, you tell him, come up with the money, pay it or else, you know, that that's sort of like, that's usually all I had to do to get paid. Yeah. So I told him that. And then the guy told him to go F himself that he had somebody behind him. And then it kept escalating. And at some point or another, that case came to haunt me. So I had really nothing to do with the actual credit cards, with the defrauding, with the, I had nothing to do with that. But Your I name got thrown up in the mix. I got thrown up in the mix. And because I was the big guy that, you know, he's the mob guy, they made me the quote unquote hub of the conspiracy. Wow. And I go, how the frick am I a hub of a conspiracy? I didn't even know how they're doing it. Like I learned in court how these guys were doing it for the first time. You know, like that's like the first time it was explained to me how deep this thing was. And I'm like, Dang. wow, these guys are so stupid, huh? It was pretty intricate, you know? So whatever the case was, that was another case on my, so I got the Fed case coming down, I did, which they didn't indict me on yet, but they're, they're up my ass. Then I got the Secret Service case. Then I'm coming home one night and I pull into my driveway. The doors swing open on the left and right, Nassau County police, cops, guns to my head. Freeze, mf -er. Move and we'll kill you. I said, son of a bitch. I could have ducked. They would have shot each other. <laughs> so I, they arrest me. <laughs> I, they arrest, well, you know, I, 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 they know what they're doing, but they arrest me. And I said, what's this for? So there was apparently a stick up that one of my co-defendants in the feds, he ended up being a co-defendant of mine in the feds. He had committed this and they arrested me for that. I never did that, but I'm, I'm stuck with the charge now. I'm not going to rat and say, he, my, oh, this, but this other guy did it. I'm, I'm stuck. Okay. I, I know I did a million other things. So that's, you know, I got to eat shit once in a while. Right. So now I'm, I got the secret service case. I got the Nassau County organized crime case and I eventually go to jail for the secret service case, which is five years while I'm sitting in jail for the secret service case on the nickel and the, and the state case for the stick up is still hanging over my head. The feds come and get me. And then the feds indicted me on a Hobbs act, which was like a Rico interstate mm -hmm. commerce. And that was all the heists and hijackings. And they charged us with army cars. They charged us with high hijackings. They charged us with uh, I think there was a tool truck on there. You know, so I never stopped doing tool trucks, by the way. They were really easy. <laughs> so, you know, there was everything on that. So sure. uh, so that's sort of like, so now I got three indictments. I'm fighting at the same time. And they were offering us life, me and my co-defendants. They, mm. they Not life, I'm sorry, we faced life. Because people go, how did you face life? No way, you didn't face life. You didn't kill anybody. Oh, yeah, you do. And the feds, you face life. And I got plenty of friends who were serving life for well, okay, 179 years, 138 years, that's right. life. You know, it's not the word life, but if you have 10 counts, for example, and each count carries a 10-year statute, that's 100 years. Now, each time a gun is used in the commission of a crime, that's a nickel apiece for each count. So now that's 150 years. Now you say, well, will the government give you the 150? If you have the audacity to take it to, to trial. challenge the government and take uh. it to trial, right, <laughs> exactly, and yep. tie up a United States courtroom for the next three months. That judge is going to hammer you. Exactly, exactly. And they send messages back to the detention centers because when you guy, you know, I'm like, I can't tell you how many of my friends had cases identical to mine and they came back from sentencing and cried on my shoulder, cried. Okay. I just got 110 years. I can't believe it. And there's still a way now, 35 years later. So, you know, this happens. So just to be sure. clear, it happens every day, 30 years later. So that said, I'm facing life. And at some point, they're offering us a, uh, 20 years. Take it or leave it. Me and my co-defendants. 
and we didn't want, we kept fighting and fighting and fighting. I had William Kunstler. I don't know if you guys remember William Kunstler. Oh, yeah, sure. How'd you yeah, get him? Oh, it's an interesting story. So originally I had Barry Slotnick. And oh, then Slotnick another good heavyweight. Off. Yeah, so I had Barry Slotnick. Slotnick came off the case because he had a conflict. And then I ended up with Kunstler. When I went to visit Kunstler, he said, any friend of John Gotti's is a friend of mine. I'm taking your case. So that's kind of like what helped. And uh, so Kunstler ends up taking on my case. And I got to tell you, I liked William Kunstler. He died while he was representing me, but I did like him as a person. Um, he was a nut job. You know, I have different views of things he did now because I'm older and I understand things that he did that I wouldn't agree with. But back then, as far as it's a person, he was definitely a good guy, a good attorney. And, uh, and he represented me. So I'm facing the 20 years. And at some point they came down and we didn't know this, but they offered me 13 years. And then my co-defendants, there were eight of us all stood up 10, nine, eight, seven, six down the line. If everybody takes a global plea, we'll give you guys these sentences. So my co-defendant said, Lou, do me a favor, take the 13. We could get the cheapest sentences. Let's get the hell out of this. Everybody's getting hundreds over here of, of years. Sure. I go, let's do it. Yeah. So I took the 13. I think it was 12 and a half to be exact. I took that and they ended up taking theirs. And then I learned when I reversed one of my cases on a technicality from prison that they had lost before we even took those pleas. There was a rat who was in the witness protection program. And I learned that when I went back to court that he had violated the program and they threw him out before we even took those pleas. So we didn't even have to take, they didn't have the main snitch. Right. right. Oh. So I was like, oh, wow, son of a bitch. But I got to tell you, looking back, I would have never changed my life. I needed that. God works in mysterious ways. And, you know, he brought me through the iron furnace to change me. And I think it was necessary. So it's the best thing that I didn't know. And I went away all that time. Uh, because by the time I reversed my case, I had six and a half years in. I had changed my life around. Uh, you know, I was a different person. So had I never had that time, had we let's say they dismissed the case before we got out by some crazy thing, or I just served the nickel for the secret service case, which would have been four years on, uh, you know, with 85% you got to do. I probably would have came back and did, went back to the same crap. I needed that big, big bang in the head to change my life. So it was now, both for the best. Did they offer you anything like to be a rat? You know, say, Hey, you know they what? Begged, if you give us this. Me. Yeah. They begged me. A lot of people go, Oh, I'm glad Vic pointed out. They, they work your way up. A lot of people go, yeah. Oh, he was never a boss or an underboss or a capo. Oh, they would, they wouldn't need him as a rat. How the hell do you think they get the capos? Exactly. How do you yeah. get the capos then to get the capos to go bad, to get the underboss, to get the underboss, to go bad, to get the boss. They work. They start with me and they work their way up. They tortured me for that. They, that was what the three cases were about. You know, they keep putting pressure on you. You got three indictments. You're saying to yourself, who the frig am I to have three indictments? Well, that and you, know, and you knew multiple families. So you would have been invaluable because you could have connected a lot of dots to a lot of families right. with a lot of things. What yeah. did they offer yeah. you? Did they offer you witness protection? Well, I, so at one point, my lawyers kept saying the feds want to talk. And then at some point they said they'll. They could even make a deal with you if you just go in a room, nobody will know the information came from you. So they were even willing to allow me to talk like dry snitch. And I said, I'll know. There's no, you know, I just saw my can do. And so what Vic said too about how they thought, you know, they realized how you could get bigger people. I'm in and out of Pete Gotti's house every single day of the week. So Pete Gotti, I'm close with Pete's son, Pete. So there's a John Gotti had a son, Peter, and then Pete Gotti, John's oldest brother, who was a captain, eventually the boss, he had a son, Peter. So I'm in and out of his house every day. So they got my phone records going back and forth to Pete's house every mm. single day of the week. So they're going, okay. And, you know, obviously I see Pete there, right, all the time. So, okay, maybe he could give us to Pete Gotti. Even if he gives us the kid, it's news headlines, right? So we got that. Now, on top of that, I happen to have been, and this was completely personal. This had nothing to do with the mob. Chin Giganti, the guy who used to walk the streets in a bathrobe, Vincent Chin Giganti, the Genovese boss, the boss of the Genovese family. Chin Giganti is the boss at the time, and he's sort of on a level with John, even more powerful than John, had more, more clout, more money, been there longer. I'm in and out of Giganti's house every weekend because I became dear friends with Giganti's youngest daughter, Rita, who I love to this day. She's my friend for 35 years. So Rita's my dear friend. I'm spending weekends at Rita Giganti's house. So my phone records are going back and forth to the Giganti Oh, house. they loved you. <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> oh yeah. And and you don't have to when you're connected to the Gigantes and the Gaudis, even if you it doesn't yeah, you're there's, a not, there's, there's no going any higher. Right. <laughs> Right, exactly. And, and, you know, and at that point, too, a lot of people would, you know, if they just heard things, they might be willing to say, well, I heard this, or maybe I know that, or... Especially the chin, know. he was so secretive. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, so I looked on paper, like, probably like a real big catch. You sure. know, I'm a mall. You know, you're pulling in a mall and not realizing maybe I'm just a guppy. You know, but you think you got a Marlin on the line. So, you know, some of the pressure that I think I would attribute that to, you know, also too, I did some big heists, to be completely honest. You know, I was, I was, I was suspected of doing a lot of big heists and they definitely wanted that too. So on top of that, um, but look, I, I, once again, I tip my hat to the guys who worked on my cases. They, they played fair. I, and I'm okay with that. The agents played fair. I, I hate, I would have hated, I would have held a grudge if people played dirty. You know, but they they put me through hell. They turned up every rock in my life. They called up ex-girlfriends. They called up every friend I had. They checked every, but they never they never crossed the line. Okay. The FBI agents, and that's that's what would have bothered me. I think it's I think when FBI agents are dirty, it makes your stomach sick because you want to think of America as a better place than that. And the FBI agents who came after me, they didn't play dirty. They got me fair and square. They tortured me. They put me through hell and they indicted me fair and square. You know, so, you know, one time an agent called my father and my father, they said to my father, who was an older man, look, your son's going to do 20 years at least, maybe the rest of his life in jail. We want to come over and talk to you. My father said, I'd rather not have you come talk to me, please. I don't want to, I don't want to think about that or talk yeah. about it. I don't want to know about it. And the agent respected my father. Now the agent could have went there knowing my father doesn't know anything about me because he didn't. My father knew I wouldn't tell my father my crimes. My father knew nothing. My father's a legitimate guy, worked his whole life. But they could have still wrapped at the door. Broke they could have, yeah. Yeah. They could have broken his balls. You know, I, when the Secret Service arrested me, my father came out on the porch. He was in his boxer shorts. It was early in the morning. And the agent goes to get out of the car. And I said, Watch what you say. I'm, I'm cuffed. I said, Watch what you say to him because it's my father. And the agent turned to me and he says, Whoa, Lou. He goes, I would never disrespect your father. I'm going to let him know you're not being kidnapped or anything. And that hopefully with a bail package, you'll be home later today. And I, and the, 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 the Secret Service agent was respectful. I saw him walk up to the porch. He's talking to my father. My father looks like he's getting calmer by the second. So the guy knew how to de-escalate my father's blood pressure. And he comes back, gets in the car. And he says, your father knows what's going on. Don't worry about it. I gave him my card. And I said, fine, thank you. So how do you hate these guys? They're doing their job. I'm doing mine. I had no beef with them. And I sure. think that's the sort of like a deciding factor. Later on, I was away with the, a lot of the Colombo guys. I was like, I told you, I was close with the arenas. Those guys had a different yeah. gripe. You know, the, yeah. the, supposedly the FBI agent was dirty, you know, working with the, he was in, he ended up being indicted for murders. You know, he's working with the, with the, the rat who's killing everybody, Gregory Scarpa. They had a reason to despise the FBI. I didn't have that same reason. I didn't feel that same way. I felt like they played within the boundaries. All right. Now you often hear about, you know, there's a code of honor and I think we brushed on that, you know, in the mafia, you, you know, like you don't hurt women, you don't hurt children, you know, that kind of thing. Is that, is that real? Definitely. I mean, but they break the rules more and more nowadays. So, you know, when I grew up, you never ever, you know, you, you defend women. You never hurt a woman. Uh, and if, if you got to get a guy, you don't get him near his house. If you catch him and he's with his wife, that's not when you got to get him. The guy could owe you a million dollars. If he's with his wife or his wife and kids, you got to let him pass. That's okay. how I was taught by the old timers. And that's how I believed. Um, now things changed. You yes. know, Gas Pipe Casso ordered uh, somebody to, when Fat Pete Kyoto went sour. Fat Pete Kyoto that's went sour and Gas Pipe couldn't get to Fat Pete. So he ordered somebody to shoot his sister. I oh. mean, come on, man. Yeah. So, you know, that's something sick. And then the guy later on, the guy who turned out to be a stand-up guy, you know, he's following orders. What's he going to do? Cast pipe will kill him if you don't do it. Yeah. So that's what, you know, this is the, this is yeah. how the mob became a cesspool of crap. You know I mean? Now he's stuck doing it. And then years later, I'm in jail with the guy. And the guy's being offered a plea. And he wants to take the plea, but he wants to include that particular shooting in the plea so that they don't come back later and haunt them with it. So he, he sends word to gas pipe, who wasn't a rat yet. I was with the guy at the time. He sends word to gas pipe and he says, look, uh, can you do me a favor? And uh, I want to put this in into my plea. 
or it happened right before the guy was with me. He goes, I want to put this into my plea. And uh, so I'm covered for it. And yes, pipe sends word back. No, we're not supposed to touch women. You're not allowed to say it. So the guy says, all right, takes 25 years, goes on his merry way. Gas pipe flips. Gas pipe tells the feds everything, including he ordered the guy to shoot the sister. And now the guy's drag, dragged back into court for that. So he says, son of a bitch, I could have included it. The guy who tells me I'm not allowed is the guy who rats me out for it. So, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm observing all this yeah, and saying, what a snake pit I was in. I don't need this crap. I don't need to be part of this garbage, you know, where I got to listen to the guy who either does, tells me to shoot a woman, an innocent woman, or I got to listen to the guy who tells me to shoot my best friend, or I got to listen to the guy who labels, mislabels somebody a rat, which gas pipe did time and time again, gas pipe mislabeled everybody a rat, had the guy killed. And then gas pipe killed all those guys who weren't rats and then becomes a rat. I'm going, what is this crap? This is bullshit. You know, this is like, this isn't for me. So that's sort of like what contributed to me going, I'm done. If I ever get out of this place, I don't want nothing to do with this. These, these people, this is, this is garbage, you know? And, and although you meet a few guys in there who think like I do, you know, if you think like I do, then get the hell out yourself too, you know, because how long are you going to think like I do and, and, and roll around with pigs in their shit? Yeah. So, you know, I wanted to talk about prison life, but I think we could all agree that it sucks. You, you were yeah. sent to a, a maximum security first, then yeah. you were cut down to a medium. How many years did that take? Well, I first, so I got designated to a max. I probably got out of the max within like a year and a half. And okay. they, they, yeah. So they told me year and a half, which felt like eternity though. You know, it's like every day, you know, when you're in a place where people get murdered, you know, it's not the same. When I went to a medium, it was like a joke. I remember the guy, when I got to the medium, I went to Otisville and I get to the medium and the guy goes to me, I went for my first little team thing there. You know, they, they yeah. like reception. And the guy goes to me, listen, I know where you are. There were six or eight murders back and forth in the, in the, within the, the, the scope of that race war. You know, I was there for the, the double homicide that day, but before and after that murders happened, right? So he goes, look, I know where you are and I know what happens there. But I'm going to tell you right now, you're not in the same place here. So if somebody says something, you think you could take it. He says, just, just brush, let it roll off your shoulder. He says, it's not the same place. Like in, in the pen, you can't let somebody try to punk you up because you're dealing with murderers. You're dealing with people who want to rape you. You're dealing with people who want to kill you. You're dealing with, so you, you got to, you got to react quick. So now I leave there and this is the first time I go to lunch in, in, the, in the medium. A couple of guys cut me online. What the fuck are these guys doing? You know, you're in the pen. Somebody cuts you. They're trying to punk you up. You know, they, they, they're trying to, it's a, it's a thing about strength and weakness. They're trying to test you. Yeah. You better do something, right? So now I'm in the medium and these guys cut in front of me and I'm going, son of a bitch. What do I break the pencil, stab the guy in the neck or the eye? You know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking into all these crazy thoughts in my head. And then all of a sudden, by the grace of God, I had that little guy. I was just with in the office. And I hear his voice and he goes, who cares? And I said, he's right. I'm in a medium. Nobody, nobody's even, I'm looking around I'm going, nobody's even looking. These guys are laughing. They're telling jokes. They might not even know they cut in front of me. I get my fried chicken. I sit down and I eat. Who cares? So I learned that it was different in the medium. Guys did things. I'm not getting, nobody's going to, somebody might cut you, but they're not trying to take, they're not trying to dr drill a, 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 you know, a rusty dagger into your heart. They might cut you with a little raise on your chin. You know, they might cut you in the back, you know, like or they might do something stupid because things happen in the medium too. But for the mm -hmm. most part, no one's trying to take you out. Everybody's got hope. Nobody's doing life. Nobody's hopeless. Everybody wants to go home and it's a different environment. You okay. know, so like I felt like once I decompressed from the pen, I felt like just a load off my shoulders. So it was good that that happened right there that first day. Mm -hmm. And I realized that, you know, guys might say or do something stupid. They don't mean nothing by it. Nobody's testing your manhood. It's not the same place. So okay. it was a lot easier. Yeah. So for you, what was the light bulb moment that, mm -hmm. you okay, you're in prison and it's like, man, I got to change some stuff, man. Mm -hmm. This is not yeah. the, the right path, but I, yeah. I got to make a huge change. Do you remember what you were doing and like yeah. how that happened? Yes. Uh, so the, there was two things happening simultaneously. One was 
the light bulb moment, which I'll, which I'll talk about. But the other one was, as I told you, I was starting to realize I was in a snake pit yeah. and these guys weren't, you know, when you look around, you say, I'd rather hang around with cops. At least they're cops. <laughs> and what they are. They, you know, this is their job, but they go home and they love their families and they're not ready to shoot their partner in the back of the head in the squad car. Cause the, cause the, the captain told you to kill your partner today. I got more, you know, once, once you start to think that cops are better, you got to, you, you got to realize you're not in the right place, you know? So, so I'm starting to think this through going, these guys are all snakes. They, any one of these guys would have killed me for money. If any one of these guys, you know, if I had two, $300,000 on a load in front of me that I just got paid for it, any one of these guys would have shot me in the back of the head. You know, how many guys Sammy was killing his, Sammy the Bull Gravano was killing his best friends to take over their businesses you know, their, their nightclub or whatever. It's, he's killing everybody. You take over the union. Inch. So at some point I'm realizing this is all shit. These are all guys who are, who think they're honorable, but they're doing the most dishonorable things that I could ever imagine. And I'm realizing that a lot of times when guys died, they didn't have to die. That a lot of times it was greed. If somebody dies and you say he went against the family, went against the Bugatti, the Bugad, you understand that. Okay. He did something. He went, he, Went with somebody's wife, maybe. You're not supposed to fool around with somebody's wife. And he ended up in a body bag. Okay, I get that. I understand that. But how about now when gas pipes just mislabeling somebody a rat and killing him because he wants something from him or he fears him? So this is what's bothering me. So this is all taking place at the same time that I end up going to the hole for something somebody else did. Somebody threw an apple at one of the hacks. And the, the, the guy, the prison guard was supposed to put us, this prison guard every week, you get visits. And your family waits outside on a line. It was, it was Brooklyn Detention Center, MDC, Metropolitan Detention Center in Brooklyn. And your family and your friends wait outside on this long line to get inside. And they might wait a half hour, an hour, but this guy would let them wait throughout the whole visit. I'm, I'm sorry, they would get, do that wait. They'd come in. And this guy upstairs who controlled how fast we went down to the visits to see them mm. would let us sit upstairs for the longest time, like he'd get, he'd get a phone call and you'd see him pick up the phone. And we started to figure out that he'd get a phone call and say, yeah, Vic and Pat's family are on the visit. Send down Vic and Pat's uh, uh, inmate so-and-so and inmate so-and-so, uh, you know, so they would see that. Then he'd hang up the phone. He wouldn't call anybody. I said, what's this guy doing? People would walk up and say, who'd they call for the visit? Oh, that wasn't that. That was just a laundry calling. So this guy was effing with us. So one day... Everybody comes back from the visits. Finally, every guy, by the time they got down there, they saw their family for five minutes. And one of the guys in my row, it was a dormitory. He throws an apple at the hack and it breaks apart in his head, off his head. So it's assault. You yeah. can't throw something. You can't throw a foreign object at a, at a, at a guard. So the, the, the goon squad comes up, you know, the, the, they call them the, uh, the turtles, the ninja turtles, you know, they got all the padding on, yep. you know, they come up and the guy, in the row points, he says, you know, he must have said the apple came from there. He points to my row, the first row. Now, everybody in my row was like 65 years old or better. The guy who threw it was an old Sicilian. You know, he was he was straightened out with the Sicilian mafia. He might have been straightened out here too. I knew a couple of guys who were straightened out in both places. That's an interesting conversation, too. But he points to my row and they figure the kid did it. I'm in my, you know, 26, 27. So they grab me and they drag me to the hole. And they roughed me up all the way to the hole thinking I assaulted a cop. I said, I didn't do it. So at this point, they kept coming to my cell going, did you do it? So I'm saying he must not have been able to say I specifically did it, right. but they must be sure yeah. it's me. So they're coming every day and they go, did you hit the guard? Did you? And I'm going, look, I didn't do it. Well, then who did it? I don't know, Sherlock. Go find out who did it. What's it have to do with me? So in the end, I was talking to one of the guys, Lieutenant of the Guards that day, and I was the food slot was low. And we were talking through the food slot because he denied me my food, my tray. And he says, you don't want to tell me who did it. You're not going to get food. So I'm, uh, I reached through the thing and I went to grab his tie and I gave it a yank. And I was a hot-headed kid at the time, something I'd never do today. I grabbed his tie and I gave it a yank and I pulled it off his neck. It was, I said, it's a clip on you, son of a bitch. I threw oh, it back yeah. at him. Yeah. So he looks, then he stands up and he's a tall guy. He stood up through the reinforced glass and he said, he goes, you think we'd wear real ties with you animals in here? Of course it's a clip on. So in other words, you know, let you moron strangle us. So he says, you're an animal. He says, look at you. He says, you're in a cage. He goes, you're nothing but an animal. And he walks, he walks away. And I says, I am an animal. 
that was a, that was the one click that moment. So everything was building up until then, but that was the moment where a guy called me an animal. I realized I was in a little cage, and even though I wasn't responsible for throwing the apple at the guard, I did a million other things that either I went to the hole for by then, or I ducked going to the hole for. So I knew I was a bad apple, and he called you know, and it, no pun intended. I was a bad apple and I'm in there over a rotten apple. Right. <laughs> and, and it ends up, and it ends up that he calls me an animal at a time when it, I was weighing that we were all beasts and savages to be involved in this shit life. That's what I was thinking. And he calls me an animal and he, he it hits me with that at the moment I realize I am an animal. And I said, my mother didn't raise me this way. My mother raised me to be good to people. My mother raised me that there is a God to pray to God. When I was a little kid, I used to kneel beside the bed and pray with my mother. And my mother died in my arms when I was young. She died of cancer. She was beautiful. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I didn't believe there was a God after that. But I started to think through things. And I said, whether there's a God or not, my mother didn't raise me this way. And I'm dishonoring her memory. And then I started to think about all the people I had traumatized, all the things I had done. And by the time I got out of that hole, I was a different person. That was the big moment. Okay. Yeah. Was That was in the max? No, that was in that was in Brooklyn medium. detention center. Okay, yeah, that, that was before I went to the back. So he's waiting on yeah. trial or sentencing. Okay, yeah, yeah. I started to read already. I asked for books. Then I talked to my friend. I said, "Send me in books." I started to read, and uh, I found what I loved. I would have never read a book before. I never read a book cover to cover in my life. I was literate. I went to high school, you yeah. know. I didn't go to college or university, but I, I knew how to read, you know. But I never read a book cover to cover in my life, and that's possible when you don't come from a family that comes from like a college educated family. Even if you went to school, the first book, my father in his seventies ever read was mine. My father goes, I never read a book cover to cover either. You know? So, you know, you come from a working family, you get through school, you know, you change oh, yeah. a couple of thoughts, you know, and that's, we all know how that happens. Right. So, Absolutely. you know, I, and then when I started reading, I fell in love with books and then I realized I found something I loved. And that's when I taught myself how to write. You have this moment. It's like, okay, you educated yourself. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, I remember listening to you on a different, uh, maybe it was an art of manliness, you know, you're reading books and you're taking notes. You're not just reading, you're analyzing, you know, that's why you're, you're learning the craft yourself. You're taking yeah. the time and, you know, you're, you're doing all this stuff and it's like, okay, you're turning your back on what you were before. Now I thought there was no getting out of the mafia. I mean, how does that work? Nowadays, Anybody could leave as long as you leave, you know, first of all, there's so many rats that, that, that okay. they, they would have a hard time tracking them all down. So you could, if you leave with honor, like I did, you know, I said, look, I'm not ratting on nobody. If I got to leave here in a pine box, that's what happens. I chose this. I made these decisions, these decisions. I'm responsible for my own self. You know, I never cried and goes, but I didn't know this. And I like the rats do. I get, to, I get fed up with the shit excuses I hear. Got to yeah. be honest with you. You know, like, you know, well, you didn't send my wife commissary or, you know, why do I got to do all the time? I only did a little of the crime. Come on, man. You know what you're involved in. You're a man. Man up. So I feel like, you know, if I'm going to them while I did, I did this in jail. I'm going to you guys and saying, look, if I ever get out of here, if I never leave, so be it. But if I ever get out of here, I just want to be left alone. Everybody tell me, good, you know, go go your own way. Do what you got to do. We, we, you know, we miss you. But. What are you going to tell me if I'm not snitching? You're going to tell me no? You know, like with all the snitches that are out there. Like one time somebody said, are you worried about your life? I says, you know what? I'll tell this to every mobster out there. After you're done killing the thousand rats that are walking around the streets yeah, come right now. <laughs> yeah. Not only that, I'll kill myself. I'll kill. You don't even have to look for me. After you're done killing the thousand, I'll kill myself because you know what? I won't even make you look for me, but they're never going to do it. They're never going to do it. So, you know, yeah, go, you know, I was just going to say that, you know, dealing with all the little gangsters, you know, that I dealt with on the job, you know, you was talking about like gangster disciples, you know, vice lords, Latin mm -hmm. kings, queens, whatever. The old timers were mm -hmm. a lot less likely to be a rat. They just took mm -hmm. their lumps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the younger kids, shit, mm -hmm. you'd offer them as like, hey, you might get like, I'll talk to the D.A., and see if they'll give you, okay, I'll give you everything. And it's like, right. right. And yeah. some were a lot mm -hmm. more organized than others. My first night, that was my second or third night as a sergeant. I'm mm -hmm. finishing up with roll call and there's a homicide. You know, it's like 1205. I'm working midnight to eight and I'm like, come on. 
<laughs> right off the bat. You know, it's like, I don't even have my paperwork done. I don't even know what I'm doing yet. You know, I'm a brand new guy. So, but I've been to a zillion homicides before. No big deal. Now this is on the South side of town with the Hispanic gangs mm-hmm. and my cops doing a cracker Jack job. There's yellow tape everywhere. Everybody's separate, you know, blah, blah, blah. And two of my cops come up to me and they're like, Hey, do you want us to go get the guy that just killed this dude? I'm like, what are you talking about? I said, yeah, mm-hmm. we know who he is. We know where he lives. We're just going to go scoop him up for you. And I'm like, mm-hmm. uh, I don't understand because on the north side of town, it was a lot of like random violence and it, there was gang stuff. You know, it's like you're slinging dope in the wrong neighborhood, you know, mm-hmm. you, or you sell, you know, dry wall instead of crack or ivory mm-hmm. soap instead of crack. That'll, that'll buy you a bullet in your head. But mm-hmm. so, mm-hmm. and I'm like, so you got to educate me guys. And it's like, well, this guy was a Latin King. Mm-hmm. He ratted on a guy and he wound up going mm-hmm. to prison for mm-hmm. like 15 years or something like some crazy amount of time. And mm-hmm. he's, he promised at sentencing. He said, when I get out, I'm going to kill you. Mm-hmm. So sure as shit, he got out. He was only out for like two or three days. He knocked on the door and the wife didn't recognize him. I said, hey, honey, it's for you. And the guy came in, just empties his gun, goes back home, sitting on the couch, just waiting for the cops. Wow. You know, it's a great just, story. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, I, we had another one exactly like that. It was another Hispanic gang where mm-hmm. this guy is in a bar. He just got out of prison, so he's enjoying mm-hmm. a nice cold beer. He's all happy and mm-hmm. stuff. Well, in come just by this other person's bad luck, a rat that was in the mm-hmm. gang, mm-hmm. and he ratted him out, and he was just in prison for a long haul, and mm-hmm. he, he was armed. He empties the mm-hmm. gun, kills the dude, and then he looks at the bartender who was cutting up fruit, you know, like limes and lemons. He said, give me that knife. He says, you, you realize I'm calling the cops. He said, yeah, I know. I, I have no problem going back to prison. This guy put me in prison. Yeah. So he yeah. just starts hacking away. Yeah. Uh, just he, he knew. He's like, yeah, no big deal. Yeah. I, it's a little, I got to tell you, it's a little refreshing for me to hear. I have to admit. <laughs> <laughs> God. But those were the old timers, like I said, you know, yeah. and it depended on which gang it was, you know, just, right. but, right. but enough of yeah. that. So, you know, we're, yeah. we alluded to, you know, like a higher mm-hmm. being and faith and all that. When you were mm-hmm. at your lowest in prison, you know, did you find God or did you turn against God? I mean, it sounds like you turned towards yeah. him. I did. I, I realized that once I, through, through knowledge, I think through reading, all the books I was reading, I was starting to learn that there's a big world out there. And then you know, I'm learning science, I'm learning physics, uh, I'm learning history, biographies I'm reading. And I'm seeing that as, I'm, as my mind's putting together all the pieces. You know, before that, all I knew was queens, right? Queens and trucks, queens and trucks, <laughs> queens and trucks. You know, and that, so it's very limited, my mind. And now all of a sudden it's opened up to all of these different things. There's, there's a whole world out there. And even, even in the scientific world, the sun rises and sets, uh, the clouds bring rain and they water the plants, the plants grow and we eat them and it nourishes the body and it's perfect for the body. So there must be a higher power behind this. And then the other thing too, is I feel like I'm being punished for something. I feel like I deserve what I'm getting. So unlike a lot of people go, I don't deserve this and they rat. I feel like I did deserve this. You can't go around, stick guns at people and, and not, think that you deserve this. I deserve this. I'm getting what I deserve. And I thought the FBI guys were the bad guys. I thought the cops were the bad guys. I'm starting to realize they're not the bad guys. They got a guy like me off the street. I don't belong on the street. So maybe, maybe they're not the bad. I'm starting to rethink things. You know, I'm starting to rethink things. And I'm starting to see that the world, maybe there is a higher power. Maybe I deserve to be punished and therefore I am being punished. Maybe one time there was a guy I remember that bothered me, somebody I heard. And I heard that the father went to visit him in the hospital. And when I heard the father visited him in the hospital, I remember it bothered me that the father would have to see the son in the hospital. And then I remember going down on a visit one day and seeing my father's face. And I stopped in my tracks and I saw in my mind that kid's father. What, you know, my father was suffering like that kid's father had suffered. My father's got to see me now in prison that kid's father had to see him in a hospital. So I'm starting to make these connections and I'm saying, I deserve this. So if there is a higher power, 
maybe it's not such a bad power. And I know what, once again, too, I obviously I hated, if there was a God, I hated this higher being after watching my mother disintegrate. This was a horrible thing. If there was a God, I felt like God wouldn't allow, wouldn't have allowed that to happen. Right. But now there's some time and space between that. And I'm able to think that my mother did teach me right. My mother did leave a proper legacy behind. It's up to me now to pick that up and, and use what she taught me. So maybe there is a God though, still maybe, you know, my mother would, would, would always teach me right till the day she died, that there is a God. If I'm not here one day, I always realize that. So I start to then realize that there is a higher power. And I start to now gravitate towards understanding that there is. And as I start to change my life for the better, as I'm reading, as I'm teaching myself how to write, as I'm, as I'm, promising that I'm never going to go back to this crap life again. And I'm showing it because there's a lot of things you could do in there that still sort of like leaves you part of that. And I'm moving away from it. And there's guys on the street that I'm letting them know, don't wait for me. If you think I'm going back, I'm not. So I'm making real changes and I'm starting to help. I, obviously I'm helping people in prison. If a guy was railroaded, I'd look over his case. Once I taught myself, well, I went through seven, after consul, I went through seven attorneys total hired and fired seven attorneys, went for tons of money, and eventually went to the law library and taught myself with a friend of mine's help. A friend of mine who was a legal eagle taught me how to study okay. law, how to file briefs. And then once I reversed my own case on a technicality, if I saw other people were railroaded, I was helping them. Obviously, there's a lot of people who belong in jail who you really don't want out. You know, I'm not like one of these people who go, empty the jails. You out of your mind? You don't want those people <laughs> yeah. out here. No, you don't. Yeah. No, hell no. And when no. I was bad, you didn't want me out here, you know, but, but there are people who deserve to have gotten less than they got. Sure. There are people who, yeah. So those, those I did try to help. And the more I was, the more I tried to better myself, the more I saw that things were getting better for me. And eventually I get, that's how the appeal happened. You know, eventually I reversed my case and I thought that that was the work of a higher power. So and, what was know, the technicality that you, that you found? Well, what happened was after I took a plea, and I, I pled guilty and they dismissed the rest of the indictment. If you plead guilty, that's part of the plea agreement, right? Yeah. And I took an honorable plea. I refused to even mention my co-defendants' names in my plea. I said, Your Honor, I won't mention their names. I refuse to take a dishonorable plea. He understood. And he, he said, you and your Confederates, he said. I remember, and I remember when he said that, I'm like, Confederates? What's this have to do with the Civil War? Like by then I'm reading. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't even know that word could be used for like friends and associates. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, I'm starting to learn for the first time. So, anyway, um, I take the plea, and the judge was in such a rush to get me in and out of the courtroom that he was supposed to ask me certain questions he did not ask oh. me during the plea allocution. And what happened was, though, I didn't know this. Yeah. My lawyer, who was a real that last lawyer I used, was a bastard. I didn't like him, and he was in a rush to get in and out of the courtroom too. And he filed a brief saying I had no appellate issues, no appealable issues. And he waived my right to appeal as soon as the sentencing was over. Real. And the appellate okay. case was interesting. Yeah. Real, real yeah, bastard. That, that doesn't sound right. real bastard. Yeah. I realize now I look back, I'll give you a little insight into something that happened here. It's a different story on its own, but the guy, the last lawyer was hired by a friend of mine who I thought was doing me a favor. And that friend had a lot to hide and wanted me in and out as fast as possible. So he would not be revealed as a rat, mm. which is interesting. Yeah, so that's yeah. a whole different story on its own. Okay. So, yeah. So that, so this guy gets me in and out of the courtroom, this last lawyer, this is before I studied law. And then I get, it was either he filed an Anders brief or I got an Anders brief, whatever the case was, the appellate court sends me something to say, or I'm sorry, sends me, CCs me in prison. So I get a copy. The appellate court instructs him to look over the plea allocution and find what's wrong with it. This is so awesome. they found something. Oh, the appellate okay. court. I said, yeah. "Wow, if you don't attribute this to a higher power, yeah, you know, that's like." And and once again, never snitched, never dry snitched, never open snitched, nothing. This is by the grace of God that the appellate court sees something. And then tells him, no, there are appellate issues and CCs me. So when he CCs me, I get a copy of this and I'm bunking. Here's, here's how God works. I end up in, in a, I'm bunking with this guy. I come out of the penitentiary where there's strong racial lines. Whites and blacks are at each other's throats, right? The Aryan Brotherhood acted death to black Muslims as soon as I got there. There's a race war going on. 
shouldn't have anything to do with Italians because we're not considered white or black, but we are considered close enough. Aryans still hate us. And the blacks, if you're close enough, if we can't find a white, you know, you're white to us. So we're okay. really close enough. But you're sort of in, you know, in the middle of that. And I leave there and I go to the, the, the medium, which was a lot better. But I do this kid a favor and he's leaving jail and he's got no clothes when he's going home. He, he said he'd been away like 10 years, didn't have any clothes to go home to. I go, look, I'm going to tell my, my mother, you're a little tiny, little bit taller than me, but everything else were identical. I'm going to tell my sister to pack up all my belongings in my old uh, uh, room, my old closet, and give me an address. I'll send them to you. He goes, what about you? I says, yeah, I'm doing 13 years. By the time I get home, they'll be out of style anyway. Yeah. Maybe you'll be able to use them for out of style. So I call my sister. I said, do me a favor. Here's this kid's address. Go pack up everything in my closet and mail it to his address. So he comes to me before he leaves. He goes, look, he was my bunkie. He goes, look, I got to, I got to, pay you back. I go, if you pay me back, I'm going to lose the, the, the good deed. I don't want you to pay me back. I'm trying to make up for the shit I did. So he goes, no, no, please let me pay you back. I go, I don't want anything in return. Please just do, let me do you the favor. Believe me, somehow you'll help me with karma. I'm working off bad karma. So he goes, no, no, no. At least let me give you a bunkie. I'll get you another bunkie. That's good. You let, you know, we got along. I'll get you a good guy. So he brings this kid to me and he brings me, I go fine. So he brings this kid to me and the, the kid's black. So I says, look, I got no problem with black people. I dated black girls. I had black friends. I had no problem with that. But I just left the penitentiary. You, you're not supposed to sell blacks and whites together. So he goes, that's the pen. This is a medium. We don't have that problem here. So he goes, you're allowed. So I go, all right, fine. Brings him in my cell. We hit it off. He became one of my dearest friends. Nicest guy in the world. I took care of him years after I went home. I sent them commissary on the sly. You're not supposed to mail one convict isn't supposed to mail another commissary. I'd send mm. his mother money, you know? So, okay. yeah. So, you know, I tell his mother, go to dinner, tell his mother to send him money. I figured out how to get around it without breaking laws. Right. So whatever the case was, he gives me this kid. Now I get this thing from the appellate division and he looks at it and he goes, I'm a legal eagle. I work in the law library all day. I could help you out. Oh, wow. He goes, get rid of, fire the lawyer. We're going to file pro se. And we'll find what's wrong with this. He ends up finding this kid was a genius and he taught me law. And through him, I ended up learning law and filed the pro se briefs with him and ended up going on to understand enough to help other people. Hmm. So I ended up filing pro se briefs with the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, fired the lawyer. And the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, when we get the judges, the three panel judge, judges there's three there's three p judges on a panel we get the panel he goes you got a good shot he reads case law all day he goes you got a good shot with this guy he goes this guy his name was uh, guido calabrese i go no italians don't like giving italians breaks i'm dead That's i go look true. at giuliani i said look at giuliani he looks up every italian he sees i said i'm dead <laughs> he goes no 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 he goes i'm telling you he goes this guy calabrese you got a shot with him so it ends up that guido calabrese writes the decision and they, they reversed the case on a technicality due to the plea allocution. So I go back to court. And that's when I learned that the guy had violated the witness protection program. And I remember the prosecutor, you know, I, and this is all, if you don't think there's a higher power, this is all happening on the heels of me changing my life. Suddenly the God, the same God I felt that put me in jail and wouldn't let seven attorneys that I spent tons of money on, William Kunzler, Barry Slotnick, and everybody else that followed, couldn't get me out of this mess. And now I'm getting myself out. The yeah. doors are swinging open. I mean, there's a God. you know. And what happened in between? In the interim, all that happened different was I changed my life. So, mm -hmm. you know, believe me, there was a saying. I remember these guys uh, that used to go to these services told me, if you have a million people against you and God is on your side, you could overcome that whole army. But if you have a million people with you and God's against you, your army ain't worth the crap. And that's, that's the bottom line. So I felt like once I came to the conclusion that there was a higher power and somebody was pulling the strings and that's how I got, eventually I went to the state though. My, my odyssey was not over. I had that stick up. Remember the stick up that my co-defendant yeah. did in the state? Well, that should have ran concurrent, but because I reversed my federal case before time, oh, that was still, I still had time. So I went to the state. Uh, as soon as I got there, they hit me at the parole board and uh, they gave me, they hit me with two years when I got there. And, mm. and so I told my lawyer, I go, 
they really want to hold me for this? I said, they're supposed to run concurrence. He goes, let me call the prosecutor. So he calls the prosecutor and he gets, and when I call back the lawyer, he tells me, look, the prosecutor said, if you want to talk, he could still get you out. I go, let me tell you. If I didn't talk when all this time was in front of me, why the F would I talk when it's behind me? It ain't happening. So he said, well, then he told you enjoy the two years. So now when I go, I get, I go back to the parole board. So the first time I went to the parole board, I go in front of them and I go, listen, I studied this. I studied that. I taught classes. I taught history. I taught uh, uh, literacy. I taught people who were illiterate how to read. I did all these things while I've been in here. And they said, hit them for two years, which was the max they could hit me for. So I said, wow, these sons of bitches. I said, all the things I said I did, they didn't care. So when I'm going back to the board, there's only like, if they bang me again, they can only gang, get me. They can only max me out at like six months more. So when I go back to the board two years later, I go in front of them with a completely different attitude. They go, what have you done with yourself? I go, nothing. I didn't want to care. I go, let them hit me for the six months. I'm not going to grovel in front of these people. I did it last time sure. and they didn't want to give me a break. So everything they did, I was nasty. I didn't give an F. And they go, we're old. <laughs> I go, oh man, this is crazy. No rhyme or reason to this crap. This is ridiculous. So wow. whatever it is, they must have quotas. I don't know what they do, but yeah. you know, so I got out. So that was sort of like, you know, I, in the end, I did eight and a half years. Oh, when did you get out? I got out in 2003, January 2003. So, yeah, eight and a half years. I went in in uh, June two, June 94. So yeah. you get out of prison. What was the first thing you did? Was there like a favorite meal or something that you couldn't wait to get? Uh, I was craving, usually crave the things you grow up on. So, you yeah. know, Irish people would, would crave, you know, Irish soda bread or, or corned beef and cabbage, whatever <laughs> mom made, right? Something with potatoes. Mom I was a you. horrible cook. I mean, I love yeah. my mom. Don't get me wrong. But Irish yeah, people well, can't cook for shit. They um, really can't. Yeah, they, well, I mean, I grew up with Irish. They, I got some good meals in their houses. So, you know. <laughs> some, something boiled Italian. and bland. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I craved Italian. I craved a slice of pizza. I craved a dish sure. of macaroni. Uh, you know, and a hamburger. We all grew up on hamburgers. Yep. I craved the hamburger. So those are the things I wanted first. And, uh, and then I got that. And once I get out of my system, you know, then you, you, you eventually you're back to normal, but I went through all the foods I craved for a long time. Gotcha. Yeah. Hey, let's talk writing your newest book, Borgata rise of empire, a history of American <laughs> mafia. It's part of the Borgata trilogy. First off, I gotta say, I loved it. It's an awesome book. I totally, totally think that people should read it. But what really jumped out at me is your writing. It's incredibly authentic. You know, some some phraseology that you use. I mean, I was just sitting. I was at the gym. I was listening to it at the gym or I was in my car. I used like the Alexa app. Even like you can you, you can download it on your on your Kindle. And then Alexa will read it to you. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's monotone, you know, whatever, but I, I do a lot better with audiobooks. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm dyslexic. I'm a really slow reader. So I have to have somebody read it to me. So mm -hmm. things like, seems like he was cut up like a hero sandwich. The mob doesn't, <laughs> the mob doesn't forget, but doesn't forgive. The mob doesn't use whiteout to erase mistakes. They use rub out. I <laughs> laugh my ass off when I am just like, oh my God, this is so cool. You know, That's great. you are so dialed into that culture, obviously. And I don't think anybody else could do this justice. You know, <laughs> you weren't over the top and you weren't like not enough. You're right, right in that sweet spot where, you know, it's like, I'm learning a ton that I didn't know about. You know, it's a lot of really good history but it's also very entertaining. I mean, how did you try to do that or is it just come naturally? Thank you. Uh, well, first, thank you. Thank you so much for all those compliments. And I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Thank you. I loved it. Um, yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, it's uh, I think that I taught myself how to write in a prison cell and I taught myself how to do write through other great authors. Like the, I would, at one point or another, I said, I don't have write. There's no writing classes. I never went to college or university. How am I going to learn how to write? And I realized that each, everything that Leo Tolstoy knows about writing, to use him as an example, is in the pages of Anna Karenina, in the pages of War and Peace. You need only read them and with a really analytical eye. And that's what I did. I would see okay. how he introduces a character, how he begins and ends a plot, 
how we how we exits a character, how we develops a plot, how the plot moves along, um, and how we sort of like maybe build suspense and etc. So I would, well, War and Peace and Anna Karenina weren't the most suspenseful novels you could read, but as I, I went on to read so many others, and I was always had an eye to how they were doing it. So I taught myself how to write, and I think that I thought that a big part of the writing craft is if you could write as close as you can to you, the way you could talk is great. And obviously though, I write a lot better than I talk. I'm like the stutterer, you know, who sings beautifully, you know, like, you, you know, I mean, I, <laughs> you know, yeah, I, I, I write better. Okay. But you know, I could go over it though. I could edit it. I could tweak it. You know, I have those opportunities, but I always wanted my voice to be in there. And I, I hope that it always strikes you as you and I are having a conversation at a pub. That's what it felt more, like. Yes, absolutely. That's great. Yeah, so that's great. So I, I think it, that. well, I think, and I just ordered one of your books. I think interesting people write interesting things because yeah. it comes out. It, it just, even, I mean, I'm sure there's people that were involved in your world that couldn't write a book because they're just not really that interesting, but you're an interesting guy. You know how to tell a story. If you know how to tell a story, you can obviously write. Thank you. Yeah, Thank I totally you. agree yeah, with you. So why, why write this specific book? Why do this trilogy? It happened, it happened by accident. I was invited by the, the, the German media group, uh, Axel Springer. They c control a lot of the media in not only Germany, but Eastern Europe, as I understand it. Mm. They had invited me to a retreat for their editors being held in Agrigento, Sicily. And I went there and because everyone spoke German as a first language and English as a second language, they seated me for dinner next to this gentleman named George, who spoke fluent English and him and I hit it off. He was in his nineties. And when I was in the mob, even I always gravitated towards older guys. I like to hear, you know, I, I, I was like, that's why I was stuck in that row with the older guys when I got caught for the apple you <laughs> okay. know, that I didn't throw. You know, I liked hanging out with the older guys. They had more wisdom. They had more experiences. They, I always wanted to hang around with the older guys. So here I am at a table with a guy who was in his nineties, early nineties at the time, maybe 92 or three. And, uh, we hit it off. We talked about history, the Middle Ages, the Reformation, the Renaissance, uh, feudal society, et cetera, et cetera, up and through the 20th century. When he tells me he fled the Holocaust with 16 shillings in his pocket, he left Austria wow. and landed in England. Yeah. And then he tells me he wants to publish my next book. Well, it turns out this gentleman by the name of George was Lord George Weidenfeld, one of the biggest publishers of the 20th century. He published John Paul II's, Pope John Paul II's memoirs. He published- wow. Uh, Charles de Gaulle's memoirs. He published Lyndon Johnson's memoirs. He published The Double Helix by Crick and Watson, on and on and on, all of the great yeah. historians, Arnold Toynbee. Um, so I was blown away. And I'm like, wow, son of a bitch. I came, you know, I came here to hang out with a bunch of Germans and drink in Sicily. And here I am now, <laughs> you know, moving with a book deal. So, you know, the next day we met and we're overlooking the runes in Agrigento. And he, he specifically, him and his lovely wife, Lady Annabelle, uh, suggested that I write a history of the mafia. And they felt that because of my experiences and maybe because like Vic was, was just saying, maybe storytelling, et cetera, you know, I, I would be the guy to be able to not only tell the stories, but to in, in, input my own insights. And I was able to do that. And, and so that's sort of how it began. Now I thought my last books took me a year to write. So I figured oh, I'll be in and out of this in a year. <laughs> I, a year went by. I was still knocking off, you know, look at the size of my library. I'm still knocking sure. off stacks of books sure. and I'm, I'm not even starting to write yet. So I'm like, wow, son of a bitch, this is going to take a long time. And it morphed into a, I was glued to my desk for the better part of seven years. I'm going on eight years now. I'm tweaking volume two. So, okay. it's, you know, by the time I get out volume three, it'll be nine or 10 years. So the whole thing's took, has taken a long time. Volume yeah, two will be out. Here, though. There's a whole lot of history going on and a whole lot of, you know, research that has to go into that. That's a lot of legwork. Yeah. Now, yeah. are you, are your, is your family from Sicily specifically? My, yeah. So I'm, I'm a sort of a mutt of an Italian, my, my mother's mm -hmm. mother. So I come out of a Sicilian womb. My mother's mother is Sicilian. So, you know, you, I'm sort of considered coming out of a Sicilian womb. My mother's father was Nabili Don from Naples, Neapolitan. And my father's both parents are, are direct first generation immigrants. They came from Bari. So mm -hmm. I'm Bares, Baresi, Nabali Don, and Sicilian. So I'm a mix okay. of those three. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. But yeah, but they would consider, you know, just, 
I would consider the strongest trait in me having come from a Sicilian womb and my mother is raised Sicilian from by a Sicilian mother, more so Sicilian than anything, but it's a mix of different Italians. Bares is not done in Sicilian. Yeah. Gotcha. So mm -hmm. reading this book, it might be helpful to do a little mm -hmm. vocabulary, you know, mm -hmm. so let's go through it real quick. Skipper. A skipper is a capo. We would say a skipper or you go see a rabbi. We would say that's basically a captain or a capo is a skipper. So yeah. what, like what level in the mob is that? He's high. There's, there's only uh there's capo regimes, capo regimes. Each capo is in charge of a regime, a, a, okay. a group of soldiers and associates. So your captain is basically who's the guy you answer to, and he goes right to the boss. So okay. that's sort of like it's middle management, I guess, or like an officer corps, um, the captains. Uh, okay. You know, he's sort of like, you know, okay. so, it's, it's basically, yeah. So a captain, skipper, and capo are around the same? Is that? It's all, yeah, they're all, all uh, the uh, accessible. Okay. Like, yeah, revolving terms for the same thing. All right, yeah. gotcha. Borgata? Borgata is originally a Borgata is like an Italian neighborhood, like they would say a barrio in Spanish. Yeah. Like a poor Italian neighborhood be, would be a Borgata. And then they use the term Borgata or the Brugade, they would say, in, in sort of like the with the Italian accent on it for like a crew. So like if you if you were with, let's say, the Gambino family, you're with John's Borgata, John's Brugade. John would be the boss. That would be his crew. If you were Vic, Vic Amuso with the Lucchese family, you were Vic's Borgata or Vic's Brugade. That's his crew and so on. The Colombo family, Percalma and Persico or Vicarino was, he was in for a little while. So that's sort of where it comes, but it comes from a poor Italian neighborhood is the real sort of like a close knit poor Italian neighborhood. Okay. Okay. It becomes a, becomes the name of a family. So that's how I use Borgata is because an Italian mafia family is a Borgata. Okay. The Don, he's the, the king, the the head of whatever. Yeah, the original the original word Don comes from the Spanish Don. When the Spanish were in Sicily, Sicily had invaders of every time. Sure. The French, the Arabs, the Spanish, the the Romans, the Greeks. Throughout history, there have been many invaders who controlled Sicily for a while. When the Spanish were in control of Sicily, they left the word Don behind. Don so and so was the lord oh, of the okay. manor. Don this, Don that. So when the mafia Don started to emerge. They used Don. And then when they came to America, the old grease balls, they would say, uh, originally used the word Don. And then that sort of morphed into the corporate culture in America, turned that into the boss, okay. right? We use boss in America now, sure. the boss. So, you know, once in a while, the newspapers might use Don. I still use it in the book because mm -hmm. it's an easy way to, you know, uh, refer to the mafia boss. But basically, they say the boss. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Now, made man. A made man is a guy who took the initiation. He went in front of, uh, you know, a bunch of other guys. He burnt a saint. He took the oath. He said, this family comes before my own family. If you call me in the middle of the night and so on and so on. Sure. Uh, that's what I was aspiring to be before I went to prison. Uh, that's what I would have gotten when I came home had I not changed because I was, I was a prime candidate. I did all my time. I kept my mouth shut. I had already paid my dues. I did everything. Everything I ever sure. did was on record. I was an easy one. And a friend asked me when I came home, you want me to put you up? And I said, no, I'm done. So that's sort of what you do. You take the initiation, you burn the sink, you prick your finger, whatever it is you've done. All right. You know, so so sort of get your thing. button. Is the, is that the same thing? Yeah. You get your button. They call them button guys. Yeah. No, you push is, your do button, you literally get like a button? button? No, nobody gives you a button. No button. No. Okay. No, they give you I the butt of their shoe in the back of your ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How about uh, Omerta? Omerta, this is interesting. So when I grew up, I always understood Omerta to be like the code of silence. Right, Omerta? You keep your mouth shut. You, you live by Omerta. When I did my research, and I break it down in the book, Omerta means a lot more than that. Omerta was everything it was in the beginning in the Sicilian culture. It enca encapsulated everything it means to be a man. So for example, you guys worked with the NYPD. You went home, you gave your paycheck to your wife or your family. You supported your wife and your family and your mortgages and your kids. And you did everything like that. You're dutiful. You're living up to what it is to be a man. Now there are other things. That's one aspect of it. You're being a man. You're supporting your family. You're taking care of your family. But then the other aspect was if you don't call the cops, you take care of things on your own. So if somebody's got a beef with you, and somebody, your neighbor says, your neighbor's been, you know, screwing around with your wife, let's say, and you want to kill him. 
uh, and you guys get into a beef, you get into a little fist fight or whatever, maybe he hands you your ass. And now you, you, you're you not supposed to call the police on him. You're supposed to now go and shoot him. Or maybe, okay. you know, you're supposed to take care of this yourself. You know, somebody's making a fool of you. You don't call the police. This is your problem. You don't go to the police. You handle it on your own. So that was also part of Omerta. Uh, so it's it's being dutiful. It's taking care of things on your own. Uh, you, you man up. You, and when you don't rat, it's not just a code of silence, but you're manning up. I'm responsible for the things I did. I hijacked the trucks. I hijacked. Nobody twisted my arm. Now I got to go to jail for it. It's time to pay the piper. You know, you want you want to dance. You got to pay the band, right? But the rats like to say, because they don't follow Omerta, well, I got a reason why. I'm doing it because, man up. You knew what you were doing. You got to go to jail. So that's part of Omerta too. Okay. And so on and so forth. But it's all in my book. You could break it. I break yep. it down in the yep. very beginning. So you have the understanding. Then I get into the blood and guts, the intrigues and stuff. But first I give you the sort of short tutorial. Okay. Uh, Guma. A gumara. Your gumara was like your girl on the side. Your, your, okay. your, yeah, it's like uh, your girlfriend. You know, most guys I knew, they would try to have like a virtuous wife at home who gives birth to their children and you hope for sons. And then they had a gumara on the side. They kept her in an apartment and they had somebody they could go around and fool around with and do all the things you would want a woman to do that you wouldn't want to ask your wife to do. And that, that's the gumara. Yeah. So plain mob, and simple. Whether, and by the way, if somebody doesn't like it out there, don't blame me. I'm just giving you the definition. <laughs> <laughs> I know he's gonna catch yeah, you. That. Don't shoot the messenger. Yeah, that's right. Don't shoot the messenger. I'm just giving yeah. you the definition. <laughs> so the mob yeah. formed in Sicily. Sicily was an island to itself. It didn't like rules or outsiders. Is there still a big influence of mafia in the, in Sicily today? Do you think? As when I was. I, the years I was active, I knew Sicilian mafiosos okay. and they, they were old school. I liked them. I got along with them. They were tough. They lived by Omerta. I knew a couple of wise guys who were straightened out in Sicily and straightened out here in the United States with a different family. So I asked the obvious question is, who are you loyal to? And they said, I'm a loyal to them when I'm there. I'm a loyal to here when I'm here. I go, what if you <laughs> got a beef between the two? And they, they said, you know, they didn't want to say, what do you what do you want for dinner, Louis? You know, they, they got off the subject, you know, so <laughs> they didn't want to they don't want to go down that route. Right. So. OK. But the Sicilians, as when I was on the street, they were still active. And okay. as I understand it, they still have a presence now in Palermo. It's in their blood. It's what they do. They're not as strong as they once were because the public doesn't put up with it in Sicily as they once did. You know, there was a time when after the after the Sicilians blew up a couple of different judges and prosecutors, um, the public was it was it nauseated the public and the public revolted and said that's it we're done okay we don't want to sit around anymore and without public support it's very hard to continue like they once did just like here in the united states it's difficult to continue without public support and without public corruption once the mob lost the, you know you, it's hard to bribe a judge when the judge makes a quarter of a million dollars a year with benefits and goes to all these beautiful galas and sales on the weekends in, in the long island sound what are you going to offer this guy that he doesn't have? Yeah, so it's tough him. to buy a judge. Yeah, he can't. And even cops. You know, I had a, my brother-in-law was a cop. He did his 20 years. You guys are cops. Yeah, you get, yeah, my brother-in-law. When I when my when my sister met my brother-in-law, she brought him up on a brought him up on a visit. At first, before I changed, I said, Is a cop? A cop? You bring me a cop? What are you doing? And then it ended up being the nicest guy in the world. He'd bring my niece and nephews when they were born, or my my two nephews rather to come see me. Uh, he was a good man. Uh, you know, he did his 20 years. He got out. He never let me down. Anything I ever asked for him, he was there for me. He was a good man. I was there for him. And when I changed my life, I understood it. But, um, but anyway, uh, you know, uh, where are we going with this? I got on my brother-in-law. <laughs> no, that's okay. He's just yeah, uh, done talking yeah. about uh, mafia in Sicily today, but Another thing I want to talk about, you know, oh, no, bribing a cop. How are you going to bribe a cop? Yeah. That's what I want. So how are you going to bribe a cop when a, when a cop makes, you know, sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year? He's got a great pension to look forward to. Even yeah, if for a hundred bucks. I mean, come on. Yeah. Five hundred or a thousand. Will you right. need that like, all in your head? But, yeah. but Lou, right? but Lou knows like the problem is right. A lot of these, there's a fine line <laughs> between cops sometimes and guys that go the other way. And what I wanted to ask you was, did, was it more about the money with you or was it more about the excitement? Because I was watching you on another podcast and you brought something up that that resonated with me. You said, you know, I'm glad it's over. 
but I know I'm never going to be able to experience that rush and excitement. And cops go through that too. Absolutely. And I had a great 20 year career of chasing car thieves. Yeah. The closest thing I get to that now is playing softball once we're coming out of the batter's box because I can't chase anybody anywhere, anywhere anymore. <laughs> so the excitement is gone. But like yeah. I was saying, there's a fine line with cops yeah. growing up in the same neighborhoods you grew up in. Yeah. And the little problem, it's sometimes not even a bribe. It's the accessibility to guys. You got the same kid going into the same candy store for 100 years, and Uncle Lou is a capo. And one day yeah. Uncle Lou says to the kid who's now a yeah. cop, my daughter got into a car accident and the fucking right. son of a bitch took off, but she's got his license plate. Right. I hate to ask. Yeah. Can you run this plate for me? The cop yeah. doesn't know or he knows, but he's going to do it anyway because he knows yeah. Uncle mm-hmm. Lou or Uncle Vito. Mm-hmm. And then that guy owes that guy money and he sends right. a couple of guys over to tune him up with a baseball bat. That's mm-hmm. It's not even really a bribe. It's the accessibility because you grew up in those neighborhoods. Yeah. And it's also too, that goes to bonding. So that bond, that bonding that you just spoke about when you grew up with different people, that's usually where corrupt relationships stem from. You yeah, know, you, you, yeah, I mean, you grew up with a guy all your life. He goes one way, you go another way, but you, you guys know each other your whole lives or your families know each other. And neighborhoods were very different when we were younger. Oh yeah. Um, you know, yeah. I mean, it's like, I, I feel like, you know, back then I could hide in any neighbor's house if the cops or the feds were after me, you know, and the neighbor would hide me, you know, like, you, you know, now I can't imagine knocking on a neighbor's door and going, I got to hide the it's cops just- or the FBI. They go, what? I'm calling the police right now. You know, so like it's a different world. So, but yeah, I totally get what you just said. And I know a million examples. I don't want to out nobody. Right, 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 million, right. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Examples of what you just said. Exactly. Um, it, then it's up to you. Like I would never, um, you know, I was a different man by the time I changed and then my sister's with my, my brother-in-law, but I would have never asked them for nothing. You, you know, I just like, I would have said, that's my sister in her life. I don't want to ruin it on that. Right. Right. So there are guys that cross that line and say, I don't care what it is. I need the information or I need something. I got to find it out. Uh, and then you had, we, those look, those dirty cops. It's a great, they, they come up in my volume three, Esposito and Caracalla who were doing all that stuff for gas pipe castle you know i mean gas pipe was paying them a few grand out on a, a month on a retainer he was giving them they they were doing hits even those were demented guys sure. those guys were sick you know your average cop is gonna go you can't give me five grand to to, to break that line and and risk my my wife my family my kids my oh, jail your pension time. everything yeah absolutely everything. down the drain not not anymore it's different when you were bribing prohibition agents in, in the late twenties or early thirties. <laughs> right, you, know, right. you guys are making two hundred dollars a month, and you're offering them two thousand for the day. Sure, you know it's a different story. J. Edgar Hoover was supposedly terrified that if he looked too deep into the mob, the mob had deep pockets and they'd start bribing his agents, and his agents might succumb to that. These guys are making five thousand dollars a year annual salary, and Frank Costello's got that in his back pocket. You know, so like. Where you know he, that was one aspect I discussed briefly towards the end of Borgata, right. the first volume, when I yep. talk about how why Hoover looked the other way. But uh, it goes the same thing with the NYPD. You could you could bribe cops many many years ago, but now their their jobs are too secure. They're too smart. They don't need it. You, you'd yeah. be surprised, Lou. Like I would have never have guessed it when I was on patrol. Never would have guessed it. Never wouldn't have believed it. And then when I went to organize crime and then we start going up on wiretaps every now and then, and I say this in my books, every time we went up on a wire, one or two cops would wander onto that playing field and be providing information. I mean, we had a case, we had Asians shipping cars out of the country and we had two Bronx cops running plates for the thieves. So wow. you never, you, yeah. you really don't know. And sometimes, and these guys, the guy, the, those, those particular cops, it really wasn't about money. They were mm-hmm. hanging out with the thieves and they were into motorcycles and cars. And when they would wreck a car, the thieves would get them parts for their bikes if they oh, blew an okay. engine or something. So it was more about a camaraderie. Like you were saying earlier, yeah. it wasn't really about the money. Yeah. It was about the com- yeah. camaraderie. Didn't, uh, didn't that guy, uh, 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 you guys would remember him. What was it? Da- Michael Dowd. Yeah, he was yeah, doing yeah. It for the rush, right? On out of the seven five or something, or the yeah, seven, yeah, that, seven. yeah, yeah, yeah. He, um, he, uh, yeah, he just got out. He's doing podcasts and things now. He, oh. um, he got caught up with a whole 
gang of guys that basically were ripping off drug dealers and then right. providing, you know, and then right. they got involved in a drug war where they were with right. one faction. And so, yeah, he, uh, yeah. And he, that was he, the rush, right? More than, more than the money. I think, I think he was like a loose cannon, right? He was just like a hyper guy. And I, in money. my opinion, I think you're right. I don't think it was really about the money with him. I think it was the rush, yeah. the excitement. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So going back to Sicily, yeah, mm -hmm. I, they're, they're very inclusive. They didn't want outsiders, et cetera. And I saw somewhere in your book that they married their cousins so they could like keep it all in the family. Well, that's interesting. I don't want to, I don't want the whole Island of Sicily getting <laughs> mad at me right now, but uh, supposedly, right. And my grandmother's rest in rest her soul. She'd go, she'd go ape shit on me right now. If she heard this, but <laughs> um, I was away with a Sicilian who said he married his cousin or I found out he married his cousin and I, thought maybe second or third cousin. Right. I found out when I went on a visit, they looked identical to each other. You know, you could take off her wig and put it on his head. Like, you know, so I was like, whoa, they were first cousins. So I talked to other Sicilians that I knew and I realized that I'm Sicilian. I'm obviously Italian American, Sicilian American. So we grew up in an American culture where it's taboo to marry your cousin. But yes. I learned that a lot of the Sicilians I knew married second, third cousins, some even first. So it wasn't sort of, and the reason being was I gathered from all my research is the marriage pools in these towns and villages, you know, it wasn't like, oh, I go to Manhattan and meet a girl. I'm going to go dance on Friday night. Uh, and then I'm going to go to church maybe Sunday, meet a girl maybe at the church, or maybe I'm going to go to, I'm going to go on online at my, on three, I'm on three dating sites. I'm meeting three different girls for tonight. Uh, yeah. You don't have all that. You got a little shit town. All the, everybody knows each other. And there was power in the patriarchy. One patriarch would control a family clan. They did a lot of intermarrying. And if you go back in time, you know, the Rothschilds kept it in the family. Didn't they marry cousins and stuff? The Rothschilds. Uh, you know, and they, they were the biggest banking family in history. Mm. So you had mafia families a lot of times doing it too. the Gambinos. Carlo Gambino was Paul Castellano was his nephew and his cousin. And then, yeah, so they like they were all interconnected, the Gambinos. Okay. There was like right. at one point we're going to see in my volume two, I go into the Kennedy assassination, volume two of the Borgata Ooh, cool. trilogy. I go deep into the Kennedy assassination. I urge everybody to read volume one of the Borgata trilogy so you can get to volume two. And volume two, I go deep into how Bobby Kennedy unraveled all of these sort of like incestuous relationships within the Gambino family clan. And he was so pissed off about it that he contacted the archdiocese and said, you guys got to crack down on these people and stop marrying them off. They're marrying each other. So, you know, and the archdiocese says, what do we do? You know, what do you want us to do? They donate too. And, you know, ah, okay. <laughs> feast. Yeah. 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 It was interesting. So, you know, you had a lot of that, well, much less of it today. You know, Sicilians are part of the global community today. You know, they're part of the world. But back then, a lot of different little towns and villages, the marriage pool was a lot, you know, was more so a puddle than a pool. Yeah, it was shallow. And, uh, okay. Yeah. So, you know, they married each other and they married each other for strength. You keep it in the family. You keep right. the, the inheritance in the family. You keep the clout in the family, you know, and, and they married. Joe Profaci married to, Joe Profaci was the original boss of what became the Colombo family. He was the founder of what became the Colombo family when Joe Colombo took over. Profaci was the founder of that Borgata. Joe Profaci, two of his daughters married bosses in the Detroit mafia and, 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 uh, Bill Banano, uh, Bill Banano married Joe Profaci. I'm sorry, one daughter married the boss of the Detroit Mafia. Another daughter, or niece rather, married Bill Banano, who was the heir to the Banano family. Then Carlo Gambino's son married Tommy Lucchese's daughter, Francis Lucchese. And so, you know, had all these guys into marrying. These are like dynastic marriages, you know, throughout time where the king marries you know, the king of the Spanish throne marries his daughter off to the king of the Eng the queen of the English sure. throne. And, you know, to so they go went back and forth with these things, even in the mob. They're into marrying up mm. until my time. So, gotcha. you know, it happens, but I don't think it happens as much today. Right, right. So Sicilian immigrants, you know, turn of the century, they weren't exactly welcomed in the United States with open arms. Lots of no. racial slurs, working subpar jobs, and they mm. pretty much only had themselves for comfort. 
and then yeah. made them stronger. You know, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, when when Sicilians, my mother and father told me that they were discriminated against when they were young, so they remembered. My my grandmother, who was Sicilian, was called an N, and my mother would was was the N word, and because she was very dark. My my grandmother, who was Sicilian, is probably she was probably several shades darker than like a Will Smith. Mm. So you know, she would go to pick my mother up from school, and they would go, you know, there's an N here to pick you up. You know, this is only, I'm going back. My mother was born in 1943 while my grandfather was fighting in the Pacific, in the Asiatic Pacific. So it's not that long ago, right? right. So she's a kid in the 50s going to school. Uh, so the Sicilians, the more I researched, the more the Sicilian Americans and Italian Americans at large were discriminated against, called the most horrific names. We all know Guinea Greaseball. I say it lightly now, but Guinea Greaseball, WAP, but also pizza ends, ends turned inside out those discriminatory names they were called and they were discriminated against on top of that. And they were the second biggest group to be lynched in the deep South, which I never knew. Nobody yeah, I didn't know that until I read your I book. Either. Yeah. Nobody knows. It's amazing. I don't know why we're silent on this and shame on the academic community for not talking about it because the academic community should teach us about the institution of slavery and how, how blacks what were, were lynched. I think that's one of the greatest lessons that should be taught when you're young, because you should know about that. But you should also know that the second biggest group were the Italians. We were lynched next. So you know what? We weren't slaves. I'm not trying to, nobody could compare the suffering of the African-Americans. I want to make, be ultra clear. But if there was a next in line, it was the Italian-Americans. You know, and look, the Irish went through a lot of crap when they came oh, yeah. here. Irish went through a ton of shit. And the Irish now left the oppression that they experienced in Ireland to come here and experience a new wave of it here. Yes. So, you know, by the English and the Germans who were here before the Irish. So everybody gets it. Like, you know, it's like the freshman gets beat up, right. And then becomes a sophomore and gives it to the next clan, you know, the next wave. So that's what happens. That's sort of like the immigrant waves into the United States. But I, I was surprised to learn the Italians were the second biggest group lynched in the South and the biggest mass lynching in U S history was of Italians. So that blew my mind. And was I that in that it. prison? I'm trying to remember that from the book. They, yes, they yes, like stormed yeah. a prison and they just started yep. killing um, Sicilians. Yeah. And the reason being, I urge people to read about it because it's a direct correlate. It's a direct connection to the mafia. Otherwise it couldn't have made it into my book, obviously. But what happened was the mob was strong in Louisiana. The mob. Yeah, had I didn't know that either. That they, they, they yeah. yeah. Huge. Yeah. They were really powerful in Louisiana. And the reason being, I didn't know. You know, I grew up in New York. My grandparents got right off the boat and ended up in New York. That's where I came from. And, you know, all my cousins grew up in New York. We all, and you always thought that all the Italians just got off the boat, Ellis Island, landed in New York. But a lot of them, you come from the Mediterranean and you end up in New York where there's nine feet of snow and you look around and you go, where can I go where I know the temperature? You know, they're not, they're not ready. They're not ready for it. They don't have, they don't have the stamina. You know, you're not, you're not talking about Germans who, who grew up maybe in snow, you know, in the snowy north of Germany, you right. talk, you're talking about, or Scandinavians or whatever. You're talking about people from the Mediterranean. So they, they saw Louisiana as two things. One is they understood the climate to be close to what they understood in the Mediterranean. And the next thing, that was where work was. So they followed wherever the work was. Mm -hmm. Now, we had just dissolved the institution of slavery. So all of that slave labor was gone, and the southern plantations needed somebody to replace the slave labor, and they had these, you know, they needed cheap labor. And this wave of southern Italian immigrants were the perfect people to replace the slaves. Mm -hmm. You know, we could pay them close to slave labor, slave labor, and and just get, you know, get them, you know, for nothing. And the, the Italian Americans who came here didn't care. They just wanted work. So they went there and they said, fine, use me, but at least I have a job and I could feed my family and then give them a better way of life. So that's how they sort of ended up in Louisiana. And then the mafiosos ride in on the wave and start to mobilize the waterfront as the Italian workers dominate the waterfront. They start gotcha. to mobilize the French market, which was sold fruits and vegetables as the Italians dominated the French market and it became a Sicilian market and so on and so forth. So once the Italians now, the Italians are beefing in New Orleans, I urge people to read this because it's fascinating. They're beefing in New Orleans. The cop gets involved, the chief of the police, yeah. who, by the way, got his job there by killing the last chief of police, which was interesting. <laughs> and because uh, that's that was the road up, you know, no matter where you are or who you are and back at that back then. So they clip the cop. The mob does. And I think that what happened was the, I think my belief is the mob was responsible for killing the cop. But 
there were a lot of people on the indictment who were innocent Italians, just hardworking Italians who got lumped into the indictment yeah. for the yep. wrong reasons. And it ends up that they, the jury saw that and the jury acquitted the acquitted them. No Italians on the jury and no African-Americans, by the way, who were very sympathetic towards the Italians because the Italians liked the African-Americans. They worked alongside them. They lived in the same ghettos with them. They voted for anything that helped them. So they got along. There were no blacks on the jury and no Italians on the jury. So you, you can't say it was fixed. You know, I mean, these people, right. unanimous jury acquits them. And the judge says, well, send them back to the jail. And then everybody calls for justice. The, the, the area said, you can't kill a cop. If you're going to walk out of the jury, then we're going to take justice into our own hands. They march on the prison and they blow their brains out. They hang them. They kill them. And yeah. it's the biggest lynching in U.S. history. And who they let go? They let the real mobsters go. Tells you who's behind everything, right? The only real mobsters who were probably guilty stepped around the dead bodies and went home. But all the hardworking schleps got killed that day. Yeah. So I urge, once again, I urge your, any of your listeners to read the book. It's very interesting. Um, and, and, you know, it's just, it's a piece of history. Not everyone knows. And I used good sources. Go to my notes in the back. If you want to read more about it, I have a great bibliography. You could then yeah, you do. take up the next book. Yeah. And continue yep. on. If you want so to more about one more, it. one more thing that uh, popped out to me from reading this book is okay. Prohibition. We all know that, you know, the, the mafia profited, off of prohibition millions of dollars and and so did the kennedys yeah the kennedys made millions bootlegging now were they in bed with the mafia at that time yes uh so there's a lot of yeah. evidence that's part two volume two of okay. the Borgata trilogy. Cool. uh but i do talk about it uh there was a lot of evidence to say to to suggest that uh first of all there was testimony from Maya Lansky and frank costello that they dealt with joe kennedy and yeah. then there's a lot of evidence that points to it as well. So Joe Kennedy had these, uh, he had the, the uh, connections to the distilleries where he could get the best stuff. He also had okay. something to do with um, uh, medical prescriptions. He had something to do with that as well. Oh, so supposedly he okay. made a lot of money in the bootlegging industry. And that's where he established these mafia contacts. So when John F. Kennedy, his son, was running for president, Joe Kennedy, using Frank Sinatra as a liaison between the mob and the Kennedy clan, was able to sort of get the Chicago mafia to swing a lot of the wards that they had control of towards Kennedy. You know, mm. they kind of eat it out in, in, uh, in Chicago. Yeah. Was in yep. Cicero, there were different wards in Chicago that, you know, Nixon lost. It was something like 50 or 60 million people voted and Nixon only lost by like a hundred thousand votes. And it was basically pulled off in Texas and in, 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 uh, in Chicago were the main places. And in Chicago, all the wards that were controlled by Sam Giancana and the mob were the ones that swung it towards the Kennedy. And then Mayor Daly, who was also considered crooked back then, <laughs> Mayor Daly had something to do with it. And then there was a lot of sort of investigation into, into election fraud at that time. And then that was supposedly why Joe Kennedy wanted John Kennedy, the new president, to appoint Robert Kennedy, one of his brothers, Attorney as General. attorney general yeah. to head off any investigations into election fraud. And that's wow. basically a big, a big component. I get into that heavily in volume two. It's cool. extremely interesting. That yeah. I think I will say, I think that the boys meaning John and Bobby, <laughs> I do believe that they were in the dark as to how much the father did to swing that election towards the son, because mm. there was a lot of campaign money funded, uh, fueled into the West Virginia primary, which Kennedy almost thought he would lose when he pulled it out. He was he was competing against Humphrey at the time. And John Kennedy, during the West Virginia primary, thought he would lose to Humphrey in West Virginia because they didn't want a Catholic Irish president there. They were very waspy. And they said, we're Protestants. We don't want a Catholic. It turned out not to be the case when the vote, the votes came out. They did. They were definitely more open minded than they anticipated. But he desperately was in need, in ca a need of cash for the West Virginia primary. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that they funneled cash to the Kennedy campaign through Frank Sinatra, through Joe Kennedy okay. during that primary, besides helping with the votes in Chicago uh, and Texas, possibly. So that said, I do believe wholeheartedly that the boys were somewhat in the dark because Joe Kennedy was secretive. You know, he didn't tell mm -hmm. the left hand what the right was doing, okay. and he had no need to include his son's in those type of shenanigans that he was doing under the table. But I do think that there was a debt to be paid back to the mob. And what happened was shortly after John became president, he was incapacitated 
Joe Kennedy was. Okay. Joe Kennedy became a paraplegic. He had a massive stroke after a golf game. And I don't think he was able to then pay back the mob or express to his sons, we know these guys. And then Bobby mm. became a real SOB towards yeah. the mob. Yes, and the was. mob got that up and that's what happened. Yeah. And okay. then we could that's that's for podcast number two if you want to come back. <laughs> that that sounds back. good to me. <laughs> so the mob yeah. also profited off the stock market crash in 29. They did. Well, well the, the mob now Joe Kennedy profited tremendously off the stock market craft. He he sold short on like just about everything and became mm. a multimillionaire during that crash. And everybody agrees that the things Joe Kennedy did during uh, uh, on Wall Street now would have landed him in jail for a million years. But there wasn't they didn't have the tight oversight they have sure. now. So pretty much what he was doing was just unethical, but it wasn't illegal in a lot of ways. Um, but that said, during the crash, how the mob came out of that big was not only like connections with that, but they got blindsided too by it. But to come out of the crash, everybody, banks go under and the few remaining banks are extremely tight with their credit. So the businesses across the country who can't go to banks for loans, they got to go somewhere. Well, uh, the, mob is, the mob is just coming out of prohibition. So where they got all kinds of cash. Yeah, they're flush with cash. Yeah. So if you go to the mob, let's say, you know, you, you and Vic can't go to a bank because you want to open up a good big podcast and you want to be national and stuff. You, can, you go to the mob and you go to Uncle Vinny. And you say, hey, Uncle Vin, I need $100,000 for electrical equipment. I need to buy microphones. I need to buy, I need to buy a disc. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to transmit it, whatever. And he gives you a piece, but he goes, look, I want 10% of the business. Sure. So, so instead, of, you know, instead of getting shaken down by a bank for the next 30 years, you just got to answer Uncle Vin. And now that's how they sort of got, back, got into industries mm. time and again. That they in, in, ended up ensconced in for the next five or six decades. Okay. which is incredible. You know, so, you know then, so many people went to them and they were flush with cash. Then mm -hmm. also World War II, they made money off of that, you know, black market and a few more things too. And mm -hmm. the government actually asked the mob for help in New York mm -hmm. City along mm -hmm. the, like the docks and such as that. They didn't yeah. want you boats so, yeah. in front in yeah. New yeah. York so we, well, Yeah, World War II breaks out and... I have my, my grandfather, my mother's father, fought in the Asiatic Pacific, and my father was seven years older than my mother. So his older brothers were old enough to fight, and they fought they fought the, uh, the Nazis in Europe, my father's two oldest brothers. My Uncle Joe was literally just finishing fighting the Nazis uh, in Europe, getting on a boat to come home, the same boat that dropped off my Uncle Charlie. So they literally saw each other passing. Oh, By wow. the grace of God, they made it home from the war. So when the Nazis are fighting, and my, my uncles now, don't forget, my uncles are the, the offspring of two immigrants that got off a boat in 1918. So they're, you know, they're Italians, my uncles. Right. They speak Italian at home, but they hated Mussolini. They became Italians. I got to tip my hat to Italians like the Irish. They came in here and within one generation, they were proud, patriotic Americans. Absolutely. And it's incredible. And fought for their country. The Irish have been doing it since the Civil War, actually. Yep. So, you know, I mean, so this is like an incredible story how, you know, today I get sick when people get off, you know, they come here and they hate the country within five minutes, where the old immigrant waves used to come here and love the country in five minutes. Yep. So it's a little bit different. But anyway, the Italians who were in America, including the mobsters, hated Mussolini, hated fascism and hated uh, the Nazis. So they were all willing to fight. Albert Anastasia put on a uniform and fought. Matty the Horse Ionello, who was still around when I was a kid. Uh, he, he was, a, I think he was a tail gunner or something on, on, you know, and had 30 runs or something over, over, oh. over, over Nazi Germany, you know? Yeah. So, you know, these guys were patriotic Americans. They fought, uh, you know, for their country. They weren't afraid. My grandfather took numbers in a bar. My grandfather, who I told you, he gave birth to my uncle, who was a hijacker. My grandfather drove heavy machinery. He was an operating engineer, drove bulldozers and backhoes. Uh, 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 excavators during the day at night, he hung out in the bar and took numbers nobody would know he had eight bronze stars in the Asiatic Pacific. He fought wow. for his country, loved his country, but you know, he still went home from the war and took numbers at night, you know? So, you know, was, that's different. So whatever the case is, the mobsters were proud Americans. So the Naval intelligence, when they realized that the Nazis got Nazi subs off the coast of Long Island or right off, the, you know, they're, 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 they're patrolling up and down the Eastern seaboard. The Naval, Naval intelligence gets nervous. So then, there's a burning of a ship in, in the port of New York and it's the USS Normandy 
rechristened the USS Lafayette after the Revolutionary War hero from France who helped us fight, uh, who helped Washington fight, became for close friends with Washington. The USS Lafayette was a, a, Brit a French ocean liner that we renamed, and that burns in New York, the port of New York. And we thought that there might have been sabotage connected to the burning of the Lafayette slash Normandy. So it turns out that a naval investigation clears it of any sabotage, but the Navy is concerned enough, and they say we need to secure the eastern seaboard, specifically the port of New York, because we're sending tons of troops and ammunition every day to Europe. And if we have to worry about U-boats and, and all kinds of sabotage on the waterfront, we're in trouble. So they, they reach out to the mobsters who control the waterfront, and they say, will you help us? And basically, the answer was a resounding yes. We'll do anything we can to help you with the war. Now, don't forget, obviously, now the feds look the other way while we steal yeah, power. Yeah, they're this making something out of that. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the, the mob is the mob. They're not going to like, you know, <laughs> not jump on an opportunity. They're very opportunistic. So they're okay. obviously stealing everything they can from the ports. In the meantime, they probably stole everything but a Sherman tank. <laughs> but uh, short of that, they made sure that the eastern seaboard was secure. And they, they made sure that the troops would get, you know, yeah. and how they did it is interesting. So they control all the longshoremen and all of the sea captains come in and report to the mob bosses on the waterfront. So they have like this roving lighthouse that it, everything they spot at sea, they're telling the mobsters who then report it to naval intelligence. So, you know, it's like a, it's like a chain of command. And this one particular guy who was a capo in Luciano's family has direct, a direct pass to go visit a lieutenant, lieutenant colonel on a weekly basis to inform of what's going on on the waterfront. So they're in constant contact. So the mob really does a tremendous job in helping to secure the waterfront during the war. And then they tried to bury that, the U.S. Navy, later on after the war. They didn't want to let the public know that the sure. Navy really you know, was in bed with the mob. And then it came out in a strange way where Thomas Dewey was accused, Tom, Governor Dewey, who originally prosecuted mobsters, was a uh, he was accused of being in bed with the mob. And then he did, he ordered a, a big, massive investigation of what the mob did to help the Navy during World War II. And then the mob, the Navy asked him to bury that report. And, the, and it surfaced after he died, after Dewey died. And that's how we came to know how much the mob has done for the United States on the Eastern Seaboard during the war. Interesting. So yeah. what should we expect in book two of the trilogy? Book two, book two starts off where book one ends, which is... Uh, uh, book one goes from the 1860s to 1960, 1860s Sicily to 1960 America. Book two picks up with Kennedy inaugurated, mm. takes over, uh, mob helps him get in, and we start off with Kennedy. And and the CIA mafia uh, plot to kill Castro, because I talk about how the mob took over Cuba in book one. So yeah. book two now, yeah. they're trying to kill Castro so they could get back Cuba. They're in bed with the CIA trying to do it. Uh, and then we go on to the Gallo revolt against Joe Profaci, the Gallo Wars. We go to the Bonanno Wars. We go to John. Eventually, we end up going to John Gotti and his uh, his sort of like he's on the rise uh, at the end of volume two. And he confronts Castellano, Paul Castellano. So we bring it up to 1985. So volume two goes from 1960 to 1985 and okay. everything that happens between there. And it's really, really interesting, even to me as as a writer, just the events itself, not sure. to not to toot my own horn as a writer, but I mean, the events itself, even without my input, are extremely interesting. OK, yeah. so how about fiction? When are you going to start writing uh, fiction? You know, the only thing I wrote was that novel. So hopefully it comes out, uh, you know, in, eventually maybe I'll go to it. Now that you're telling me mob romance is a, a hot. There I mean, you I go, could just man. the old stories in my head. You know, I mean, my whole life was a mob romance on the street. <laughs> so who would you want? <laughs> so say one of your uh, fiction books gets made into like a series or a uh, movie. Who would you want as your leading man or leading woman? Oh, I have no idea. I Yeah, I don't know. Okay. I mean, it's hard. Yeah, yeah, I have no idea. I don't even know who's like hip now, young and, okay. you know, yeah, I'm in bed with a book at eight, eight nine o'clock at night. <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> I, I know. Yeah. All right. Hey, I, I've got a Cops and Writers Facebook group. There's a couple of questions in there real quick. Ellis K. Popa asks, why is it so hard for people to get out of crime syndicates once they're entangled? I think we went through that. Mm -hmm. um, let's see here. She also asks, 
are there really cleaners like in movies like um, Pulp Fiction? Uh, yes and no. I mean, they don't call okay. them cleaners, but you got guys that, that I know guys who were on murder scenes and they basically, you got, you're supposed to take part in something like a murder when okay. you get straightened out. You used to, the rules are different now. You don't have okay. to, but you used to have to take part in a murder to get straightened out and taking part didn't always mean shooting the guy or killing the guy or strangling the guy. Sometimes the guy who came in and mopped up the floors was part of the, oh. part of the crew. So, okay. you know, he cleaned that, he cleaned up the mess afterwards. He put the body in the Ugh. bag and he put it in somebody's trunk and he got his button because he participated in a murder. So, oh, okay. you know, would you call him a cleaner? Not in the same sense as Pulp Fiction, but he cleaned up a murder scene and he got his button. So, oh, okay. you know, but there, there were also people... guys, but there were also guys that you could bring a car to, to crush a car or to shred mm -hmm. a car because the cops are going to be looking for it because it was involved in something to make it disappear. Yeah. Vic, I brought a, I brought a million cars to people, not for not for murders, but for I, I do a heist and get rid of the car. Yeah, All I, right. I, I do a heist and get rid of the car. So I bring I bring it to a guy and say, look, take the parts. You know, he was happy he got all the parts, and I was happy that it gets done. All over. right. Yeah. Ellis so, has yeah. another question. I've already had so much family drama and hometown gossip with my little old YA suspense coming out. Has Mister Ferrante experienced any crazy drama or incidents? since he became an author with his former associates with my former. So I, so I have no problems with them as of now, the guys I still see on the streets once in a while. Yeah. Hello and goodbye. They know I never ratted. Uh, there are a few guys who are hardliners and say, well, you're a rat. If you even talk about it, mm -hmm. are, are you kidding me? You know, I mean, I never put anybody in jail. I never took the stand, never gave information above or below board, nothing. Uh, you know, so, I mean, talking about it is talking about it. I'm talking about stuff that's 30 years old. You okay. know I mean? I, yeah, so I never ratted. So I don't get any drama from people. The guys who really knew me, they still respect me. I bumped into guys. I was in Staten Island in November. I bumped into a lot of guys that I knew from back then. They were all happy to see me. They all gave me big hugs and kisses. I was happy to see them. They know I never ratted. I know they never ratted. That's the bottom line. Gotcha. Um, so... You know, right. that's, I had, I had one guy email me once. So I changed the name in my memoir and gave yeah. a guy a different name. Who's now a captain in the, in the uh, Gambino family. And he emailed me and said, I hated the name you gave me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. That's it. Uh, uh, Miriam Hashem says, I don't have a question, but I do have gratitude. I read Mr. Fronte's book on what the mob can teach businessmen a few years ago. It is a goldmine of a book. I reread it on a regular basis. I work as a geopolitical analyst, mostly focusing on terrorism, and I use concepts from the book all the time. I'm usually the only woman in my very misogynistic environment, so I have lots of fun applying Mr. Ferrante's concepts to change the power dynamics. Does he ever come to Ireland or the UK for book tours or festivals? Wow. Thank you so much. I, I will say first, that was a beautiful compliment and I'm glad it's been useful. Uh, I used to go to the UK much more often than I do now. I hope to go back there. If yeah. someone invites me, I get on the plane and go. Um, I Unfortunately, as many friends as I have who are from Ireland, uh, and I met great guys in jail who are from Ireland, I have not been to Ireland. I hope to go. Uh, I love the Irish people. I love the Irish culture, so I hope to go there. Um, but uh, ask her if she could invite me, have a group invite me, bring me over. Okay. Uh, I'm there. So Sweet. let's let's hope. Yep. And everybody, all your listeners could Facebook me. It's the Facebook with the red. It's a, You'll see a picture of Borgata. Okay. Uh, so feel free or go to my website, louisferrante.com, sure. and drop me an email. Sounds good. So let's start wrapping this up. Man, this is <laughs> – I could talk to you, both of you guys forever. This is so much fun. Uh what advice would you give to a kid or an adult who's pondering the gangster lifestyle? Don't do it. Uh, you, the mistakes you make when you're young, you might think that they're easy mistakes. Uh, it's not the same as, fall, as falling off a bike where you got a scab and it, it, it's, you know, it's better by the end of the week. Mistakes you make when you're young that are big last for many, many, many years, and they're very hard to undo. And a mistake like this took me many, many years to undo and a lot of suffering uh, so I would, I would advise you the same thing. And a lot of people die in the interim. I have friends who died. I have friends who never leave jail. I'm very lucky that I'm here. Um, but don't do it. Don't make a mistake that you'll be, you'll regret for the rest of your life. Uh, make stupid mistakes that you could fix by the end of the day. Don't make big mistakes that are going to last years or take or, or hurt other people or yourself.
Okay. Yeah. So uh, the next question is for my deep thinkers. And I think you're a deep thinker, Lou, you know, and somebody who's been through a lot of stuff. So if you had a billboard that millions could see, what would you put on it? Like a favorite quote or saying? Trust in yourself, have faith in God, and you can never do wrong by doing what's right. Perfect. I love it. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So let's wrap this up. Mm -hmm. Where do people go to find out more about you and your books? Uh, LouisFerrante.com, L-O-U-I-S-F-E-R-R-A-N-T-E.com is my website. Everything's there. Uh, you could you could find the books anywhere. They're in Amazon. They're in Barnes & Noble. Uh, but also you could via access, you know, via the website. Uh, there's also a thing there. You could feel free to email me. I try to get back to everybody. Sometimes it takes a little time if I'm busy, but I eventually do get around to answering all my emails. Um, so feel free to get in touch. And uh, and I hope everyone buys the book. You could find it anywhere, any bookstore, anywhere books are sold. Um, once again, Borgata, the Borgata Trilogy, volume one out uh, is out now. Uh, and also that lovely lady mentioned Mob Rules. Mob Rules was my international bestseller. It was translated into 20 languages. Uh, I was very fortunate that book had tremendous reach across the planet. Um, and it's and it continues to sell well. Uh, that sort of, uh, that's been probably the best thing I wrote until now. So hopefully this out does that at some point. All right. uh, but I, yeah, I, I, I just hope that people enjoy the read. And I'm glad uh, I had an absolute uh, great time with you and Vic, Pat. You guys were great. Absolute pleasure to talk to you both. Extremely intelligent men, fun to talk with. Uh, that was great. Uh, not hey. since you know Brett Brett McKay, who you who you mentioned, yeah. was another br brilliant guy. So I'm not surprised you listened to his podcast. Now, Vic, do you have anything before we close out? Yeah, sure. Just tell your listeners to go to my Amazon book page. Type in my name, Vic Ferrari, like the car, where you can preview all my NYPD behind the scenes stories for free, $10 paperback, $2.99 ebook download, and my podcast, NYPD, Laughing in the Line of Duty. All right. Thank you, Vic. And thank you, Lou. This has been a whole lot of fun. Same here. Thanks, guys. Have a Lou, great Lou, day. Lou, Lou, I got, I, oh, wait, wait, stop the recording because I want to ask him something.